explaining to the students what we have witnessed through their their results and their engagement after obtaining their degrees i know that many of the students of this department have got their services their jobs in the state in the country and even in the abroad when we come to the point of international webinar and when i was approached to be here in this webinar and particularly in the inaugural program i remember that yes the theme and the sub themes are very much pertinent to the present day context and i also remember that in my department in the university postgraduate department many times we have celebrated international women's day inviting some leading journalist and arranging some discussion workshops regarding the role of women journalist in the society and their importance the pandemic pandemic situation we all know that we are now confined at home but question arises whether our confinement at the home has given us opportunity to exchange our ideas with national and international experts so these today's international webinar i am sure will give a scope to ex exchange the ideas related to the very important and pertinent theme in the today's context women and media the changing narratives and identities the representation of women in media has come a long way from the early days when women were shown as secondary characters with stereotype portrayals however during the lockdown all over the world we have witnessed that the increasing rate of domestic violence and abuses against women on the other hand we have seen 
how women leaders of nations like new zealand and germany have led the whole country through the pandemic in recent times the media narrative on women have been changing at a large scale we have seen global movements like me too which challenged the patriarchal abuse of power however still much of its restricted in certain section of the society there is large section of the society which resides outside the domain of digital access the awareness and realization required for women empowerment are still not diffused at all sections of the society but that does not mean that only women with access to internet have understanding of women empowerment and self worth the issues of women empowerment prevails at all sections of the society beyond class beyond caste beyond religion and beyond race media have an important role to play here and media is that magic multiplier as we have seen that convey development messages in an attempt to change the mindset of the millions of people but as the dominant paradigm of development communication has passed so in a similar way here we need to be cautious what we are portraying as women empowerment and women liberation media have played great roles in many cases for gender parity be it mobilizing public opinion against the brutal delhi gang rape case or with recent portrayal of equal roles of women in many cinemas and soap operas but the questions remains is it still enough media still carries stereotype portrayal of women there is still objectification of women in visual media there is still more negative news about women in media and there is still less coverage of women's cricket in sports pages of newspapers further women in media have come a long way from being only the presenters news readers or anchors women have proved their worth again and again as war journalists as investigative journalists as photographers as cinematographers and in many more roles still many roles in media industry are perceived as the roles dominated by men and not for women the questions is that narrative changing as in one hand we need to explore how media are shaping women identities on the other hand we also need to explore how the narratives on women working in the media industry are being formulated it is high time that we realize the importance of equality and media in this information society is going to play a very important role in it thus in this webinar i feel the women's college calcutta 
have taken right decision to organize this seminar at the right point of time and i believe that the international speakers and experts researchers social reformers will deliver their views and i also feel that the deliberations of different experts will give some directions to the society so that women empowerment and women liberation is realized in true sense with this i once more extend my heartfelt thanks to the organizer specially professor mohan das principal of this college and teachers of this college who have given me opportunity to be here in this inauguration program of today's international webinar on media women and media the changing narratives of identities i am sure that this webinar will give all the participants all the viewers across the globe a proper guideline and in future obviously we will see the proper women empowerment in true sense with these viewers formally i inaugurate this two days international webinar i say that the seminar the webinar is open once more i thank you all thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir for finding time for us from your busy schedule your gracious presence has made the inaugural ceremony auspicious it is an honor to have you with us now to officially welcome you to all to the seminar and sorry to the webinar and to give you a glimpse of the two day webinar i would request the convener dr surita basu assistant professor journalism and mass communication and coordinator iqac women's college calcutta to deliver the welcome address hello i guess i am audible now ah uh, Oh, sorry for the technical glitch. I guess that's what uh, we are now today in the situation. We are have to uh, face these glitches either outside with the pandemic or inside with this technical problem. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express my sincere gratitude to uh, Panigrahi sir. Uh, it's a huge. We are privileged that you have taken time and joined this. Uh, Uh, inaugural ceremony of this webinar and also i need to i uh, have to make an announcement uh, our principal madam dr mohan das was supposed to join at 5 today but uh, 10 15 minutes before he she made me a call and she informed she had to leave for an immediate important meeting uh, which starts uh, very soon so she wouldn't be able to join but she she has conveyed her uh, best wishes for the webinar and uh, she has uh, she will uh, try to join whenever she may and will expect her uh, uh, joining uh, whenever the she is she gets free uh, but on behalf of uh, our principal dr mohua das i welcome you all and i thank uh, panik rahi sir for this uh, very interesting uh, in inauguration and uh, thank him for officially inaugurating this webinar uh, to begin about the webinar first and foremost most of all of course uh, we have got a ugc letter calling the organizing webinars on women related issues uh, that triggered our thought 
behind it, which actually was led to the right direction in right time by our principal madam. The concept of identities and narratives has long been dominating a large part of academic discourse. In reference to the classic uh, debate between nature and nurture of Plato and Aristotle, the nurturing in recent times is playing more and more crucial role as we submerge ourselves as floating reference in the ever-growing sea of mediated symbols. The identities thus are largely manufactured by media constructed through dominating narratives. With the rise of alternative media, however, the alternative narratives are getting stronger uh, ever, ever faster over the last few decades. It has led to changing perception, changing interaction, and transforming identities. This webinar thus explores these changing narratives and identities of women, the undefeatable secondary netizens of this new world. In the two days webinar, we are going to explore diverse narratives of these changing times, starting from the concept of communicative injustice of Dr. Jimmy K from University of Lister in her keynote address, followed by an interactive plenary discussion among women professionals in media industry, led by Dr. Fatima N, and a technical session chaired by Dr. Sweta Singh, which seeks scholarly paper from India and UK on advertising, cinema, social media, association of practices through community interaction, communicative practices of women health workers during pandemic, and the Hungarian twin audiences identity production through Disney Princess. Tomorrow, on the second day of the webinar, we start with a gender research stalwart from India, Professor Joyesri Jetwani, a senior ICSSR fellow and a former IMC professor, with her deliberation on wage equity for women journalists of India. Professor Jetwani's session will be followed by Professor Ujwala Varvis' panel with women researchers across India and UK who are researching on multiple aspects of women and media. Dr. Swetha Singh on the last technical session of the webinar will explore six more papers on subjects ranging from South Indian cinema, social media trial, Hindi cinema posters, journalism education, South social media activism, and digital divide during the pandemic. We are extremely grateful for, to our keynote speakers our panelists, chairs, and all the paper presenters, and all those who have sent their papers, but we could not accommodate due to the lack of time for accepting our invitation in such a short notice, for your kindness in taking this extra measure for coming together in an academic interaction, and for standing all together today, even amidst this global pandemic. And I again express my sincere gratitude uh, to Professor Pani, Pijush Kanti Pani Grahi, sir. Uh, even just days before the first ever digital exam being conducted by the university at this large scale, Professor Pani Grahi has taken time out from his busy schedule for us. It is indeed a privilege, sir. Thank you so much for present here and inaugurate the office of, officially. Uh, with this, now I... Uh, over to Delina. Thank you, Man, for explaining the concept of the webinar. Now, to begin with the main session of the webinar, I would like to call my colleague, Srimati Sangeeta Bhattacharji, a member of IQAC and also assistant professor in the Department of Economics of Women's College, Calcutta, to introduce the keynote speaker the day of the first day of the webinar. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, am I audible, everyone? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. And the Department of Economics and member IQSE to introduce you all to the keynote speaker of the two-day international seminar. Dr. K is a lecturer in media and communication at the University of Leicester. Her research works are rooted in feminist media and cultural studies. 
All her research and writing is animated by her central interest in how feminist theory can be mobilized against injustice. Her monograph entitled Gender, Media, and Voice argue that women and other marginalized groups are denied meaningful voice by the contemporary media culture. She terms the insidious way as communicative injustice. Dr. K, am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Dr. K is the co-editor of a volume on the wedding spectacle in media culture. She has published several works on feminist anger, reality television, the mediation of the women's suffrage movement, the history of talk shows on British television, and the I guess there must be a technical issue. Can anyone check with uh, Shongita Di whether she is able to join? Yes, I'll check in a minute. Due to technical issues, Sangeeta Di had to leave the meeting, but she'll be joining us in a minute. Uh, 
uh, if she has a should we go ahead rilila any idea if she is going to manage to join back shangita di says she is not being able to join currently if you could go ahead okay, no problem we can we can go ahead definitely uh, so thus we uh, uh, officially in the inaugural ceremony and uh, move ahead with the uh, keynote the main theme of the seminar first keynote address of the seminar a uh, webinar and once again i uh, thank uh, pijush shanti sir uh, sir you are most welcome to stay back and uh, listen to dr jilly k's uh, interaction uh, but uh, we will understand considering your busy schedule but would love if you can stay back and uh, listen to this deliberation okay hello hi can you see me and hear me okay Yes, yes. Uh, so, Baljili, uh, I think I will, on behalf of Shongita, the I will just introduce you. Then you can move ahead. It's fine on your end. Uh, we can see and hear you. So, uh, Dr. Jili K, as I'll start again, is a lecturer in media and communication at the University of Leicester. Her research works are rooted in feminist media and cultural studies. All of her research and writing is animated. by her central interest in how feminist theory can be mobilized against injustice her monograph entitled gender media and voice argues that the contemporary media culture which she terms as communicative injustice the insidious ways that women and other marginalized groups continue to be denied meaningful voice Dr K is also the co-editor of a volume on the wedding spectacle in media culture she has also published several works on feminist anger reality television and the mediation of the women's suffrage movement the history of talk shows on the british television and the class politics of reality celebrity she was also the co-convener of media and gender research group at the university of leicester and the editor of the cultural commons section in the european journal of cultural studies with this i welcome dr jili k to uh, deliver her keynote address of the first day of the webinar jili over to you <clears throat> thank you so much um sahita and thank you to all of the um the organizers um for for organizing what looks to be a really really wonderful event and i'm really pleased and really delighted to have been invited so so thank you once again and i know it's no mean feat to organize something like this um a, an online event during a a global pandemic so it's to your credit that you've organized such a wonderful event um so um um i you know i just a little bit more about my background thank you so much for the introduction there so yes i'm a i'm a lecturer um in media and communication um at the university of leicester and you know, most of my interests are in are in feminist theory and the relationships between uh media culture and feminism um so all of my various forms of research are interested in it um so um so um my sorry, my sorry but uh the audio is not that's uh, that sounds much better um uh so most of my research is very much rooted in the uk context um and is is interested in that kind of specific context of gender politics um um it, mostly in 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 the uk um so i'd be really interested to um to hear about what uh um how some of the theories and ideas that I, that i'm going to be talking about may uh, can be kind of um applied to or rethought through um the indian context so i'm really looking forward to having um a conversation um with you all um at the end so um I just want to check will somebody give me maybe like a 5 um a 5 minute warning just before I coming to the end of time would that be possible to get a little to get a, to just to get a little 5 minute warning so that I know Sure 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 no issues will that would be really helpful thank you okay so I'm now going to try and share my screen so hopefully this will work okay um okay and then I'm going to share my slides so hopefully you can all see those okay um please give me a shout if there's any issues um so my talk is called gender and communicative injustice the politics of voice um in contemporary media culture um 
and it, it draws really on my recently published book, which is called Gender, Media and Voice, um, Communicative Injustice um, and Public Speech. Um, and this book is really my attempt to try and think through the kind of paradoxes of the contemporary moment, where on the one hand, um, it seems like there are more possibilities to have a to have a voice, to have um, to be able to speak publicly than there ever have been before. And yet, um, on the other hand, um, it seems that meaningful voice, to have a meaningful voice in the public sphere is increasingly difficult to attain. You know, and we can link this to the um, ongoing crises of democracy, um, ongoing or rising levels of misogyny and so on. So I was very, very much interested in this paradox between the idea, this sort of spectacular promise of voice on the one hand, and yet the insidious ways in which meaningful voice is denied on the other. Um, so that's broadly what the book is about. Um, and so some of the questions that the book asks and some of the questions that that we can maybe think about um, today um, well, first of all, what does it actually mean to have a voice um, in contemporary culture? So we hear this term used a lot, you know, that we should all find our voice, that we should all speak up, that we should all speak out. But what does that actually mean? Um, how is that made possible? Um, and how is that potentially uh, that that capacity for voice? How is that undermined? Um, and of course, I'm particularly interested in gender and this obviously this this webinar is interested in in the question of women, um, or women's identities and women's narratives and how those how those are changing. And a lot of people make the claim that we're now in a very different or radically changed moment um, in a post Me Too uh, world. So Me Too's already been um, mentioned as a um, as you know, the, the kind of global uh, mo online movement against um, sexual harassment and abuse. Um, and there's often a very optimistic idea that Me Too has sort of enlarged the possibilities um, for speaking out. And it's uh, it's really changed the whole communicative terrain. So there is a very powerful idea that it is now more possible for, for women in particular to be able to have a voice, to be able to speak out. But my talk is going to... Um, Sort of complicate or ask questions about whether this is actually whether actually we can actually make this claim that we are in this sort of um this moment where where meaningful voice it really is now possible um and and i think you know it's it's actually much more complicated uh than that and i think the the struggle to find meaningful voice is actually uh possibly much more difficult um than has hitherto been um uh suggested um, so just to kind of um, to situate this in a kind of longer historical frame, which is what I think is really important to do. I think it's really important that that we understand the sort of contemporary crisis of voice or the contemporary denial of voice, particularly to women. I think it's really important to situate this in a longer um, historical frame. And of course, um, the history of women, the, the history of the silencing of women has is 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 very very long, and its roots run very very deep. Um, so um, the the um, the the UK academic um, and classicist uh, Mary Beard um, um, has written about this very long history of the ways in which women's voices have been silenced in Western culture. Um, and she she makes this argument that there is a culturally awkward relationship between women and the public sphere um, of speech making, um, debate and comment. So there's something about the kind of contemporary public sphere in which women's voices are kind of um, uh, uh, they have an awkward relationship um, with the public sphere, um, which is which is overwhelmingly and historically associated with masculinity, uh, with men's voices. Um, and she says this is um, because when it comes to silencing women, Western culture has thousands of years of practice. So she links this back to uh, uh, she to classical antiquity. She, she relates this back to um, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, where she says um, where the kind of the sort of uh, the foundations of, of democracy, if you like, were um, emerged and she says you know at that kind of foundational moment when when ideas about western democracy were developing women and other groups actually were excluded from the participating in the public sphere and actually she says that public speech was 
almost entirely associated with men to the extent that if you were a woman speaking in public by definition you weren't really a woman because it was seen as so kind of um, at odds with 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 femininity um, so she she traces it right back um, to that kind of foundational moment. And she says, we're still living with that legacy today. So even though we seem to, you know, have made great leaps and strides and progress, actually, we're still living with this legacy where women's speech is seen as out of place um, in the public sphere. And in the English language, and I'd be interested to know if there are different languages which, which, which have a similar kind of pattern, um, but in the English language in particular, um, Mary Talbot has pointed out that there are an astonishing variety of words for vocal women and these words are all deeply negative so the words in some words in the English language for vocal women are scold, shrew, gossip, nag, virago, harridan and so on and so on um, so all of these are obviously deeply negative and condemnatory um, and so the idea uh, there is something in the, both in the kind of the politics and the language and the culture um, which uh, which sees women who speak out as kind of deviant or wrong um, as out of kilter or out of step with kind of idealized uh, modes of public speech. Um, and so um, Anne Karpf notes that Actually, if you look at much of history, and again, she's uh, writing about Western um, history broadly, um, she says that the idealized mode of speech for women has actually been not to speak at all, but rather to be silent. So um, she points to Aristotle's um, proclamation that, um, that silence is woman's glory. And she points to lots and lots of examples in, um, in Western culture in which um, idealized femininity over and over again is associated with silence, with not speaking, or at least with being very demure and very quiet. So these are some of the obstacles, I think, you know, these very long histories, which constitute uh, really significant um, obstacles to having meaningful voice um, um, in the public sphere. Um, and so again, historically, we can we can look back to um, and, and these are examples from England um, in the early modern period, there was an, there were extreme forms of punishment for women who were seen to be scolds or nags or gossips. Um, so these images depict um, the ducking stool, which was this device, which which um, uh, an offending woman, it was mostly women, um, were strapped into and, and ducked into a river or some or some cold water. So, you know, there was, you know, extreme uh, state sanctioned um, punishment to to punish women's voices that were seen to be transgressive, that were seen to be vocal um, scolding and so on. Um, similarly, another contraption, another form of um, punishment was the um, the scold's bridle, which would often literally silence women by by pushing down their tongue um, with with a metal spike. So these are, you know, some some very kind of egregious and brutal forms of punishment um, which have been used to uh, to to silence women um, and and other marginalized groups. Um, so what I try to argue in the book is that, you know, we, we no longer have these kind of very extreme, brutal, highly visual forms of um, of punishment for, for women who are seen to be speaking too much or too loud or saying the wrong thing. Um, and but actually, does that mean that that women are free to speak? Does that mean that we're in a completely different moment where uh, where 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 women's voices can be heard, can be loud, um, can be transgressive? Um, so I argue in the book that things like the ducking stool and things like the scold's bridle are a form of communicative injustice. So by that I really mean the kind of denial of meaningful voice. Um, um, but I also argue that, you know, that, that, that contemporary culture is also characterized by communicative injustice or the denial of meaningful voice. But it now operates in much more insidious ways, which can't be captured quite so symbolically and visually um, and strikingly um, as, as, as these images um, here show. So 
we do seem to be in this really, really different moment. So whereas women's voices, as I've pointed out to have historically, you know, if, if the idealized mode of women um, speech for women historically has been silence, it seems like now we're in this, this new moment where women's voices are being celebrated. So here I've just got just one example is that um, it used to be that if you bought a book, um, um, a kind of compendium of famous speeches or brilliant speeches or great oratory it would be very very hard to find a speech by a woman whereas in recent years um there have been as there's been a kind of slew of publishing of these of books which uh which are kind of celebrating the rhetorical skills of women, which are celebrating the public voices of women. So the fact that women are speaking up, the power of women's voices, um, celebrating you know, the, the women's rhetorical um, skill, which is seen to be just as good and just as important as men's. So on the one hand, it seems like women's speech is kind of now being given center stage, that, that, um, that now women's speech is being amplified and celebrated um so it seems like these kind of historical exclusions and inequalities or communicative injustices are now being kind of visibly and rigorously uh, vigorously challenged um, and contested um but of course as we know and as was set out already in the beginning of the um of this webinar um it's we're in a very kind of um uh uh, ambivalent moment really so on the one hand there seem to have been you know great strides and great progress um, and yet on the other speaking as a woman in the public sphere as as many people here will know is incredibly difficult and often comes at great uh, cost because of trolling because of online hate uh, because of uh, the ways in which women when they speak out still tend to be kind of ridiculed or demeaned or their their voices are, are dismissed um, so it's this very ambivalent moment that I think that we're in. Um, so I uh, just want to sort of situate this, I guess, in in a broader kind of context now to, to kind of think, well, what do we actually mean by then having a voice? Um, what is the, how, how can we understand the contemporary context? Um, and the and the i guess the possibilities that it that it that it seems to allow for voice but also the kind of insidious ways in which voice um is denied and i think um the scholar um jody dean's work is really really useful because she um writes about this concept of communicative um capitalism uh, and so she argues that that we're in a kind of a period of of capitalism which which she calls communicative capitalism which is characterized by the kind of intense proliferation of communication technologies and that's how capitalism um operates in this particular stage um, and her question, I think, is really important, really powerful and useful, um, which is, um, she asks, why has the expansion and intensification of communication networks, the proliferation of the very tools of democracy, coincided with the collapse of democratic deliberation and indeed um, struggle? So again, it's this kind of, I think she points this really important and interesting paradox, which is that on the one hand, it would seem that the the tools which are required for for meaningful voice for 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 democratic participation seem to be kind of at our fingertips with you know with the proliferation of 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 all of these forms of of new tech new communication technologies um and yet at the same time you know it's this very optimistic kind of narrative about what that uh, uh, about the possibilities of that has to be set against the reality in which you know democracy is not in, in a in a period of uh it's it, well there's very little i guess to be optimistic about at the moment when it comes to democracy if we if we look on a global scale um at uh you know the rise of all sorts of uh very worrying uh trends um and new forms of 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 hate and discrimination um and so this paradox i think is really useful to try to to think through this 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 ambivalent moment um and i guess the question then is maybe the problem is uh is actually that uh, it's this, it's actually the seductive illusion that we all now have voice that is the problem, not the solution to the crisis. And that's because Jody Dean says that um, in communicative capitalism, it's through participating in the circulation of, 
of content online that we feel political we feel like we're politically engaged but she says what's happening then is that our political energies become then reduced to the kind of mere registering of opinion online um and she says actual polit political power like genuine structures and centers of political power take note of the existence of these opinions which are circulating online but then just carries on as it was so it kind of uh so what seems like extremely vigorous and energetic political activity taking online uh taking place online she says is actually not really able to uh to to tap into or change uh actual actual power um so it's this so for her it's this it's an illusion that we have voice and this is the problem because it's 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 diverting us from you know the the operation of actual political power which is working in a very disturbing and uh uh problematic direction okay sorry i'm conscious that i've got quite a lot to get through so um i um i'm trying not to rush too much but i also have quite a lot of um quite a lot to get through um and so to, to link this then to gender politics i think we also see this kind of real paradox at the moment in contemporary media culture um where there is this sort of promise of voice on the one hand and this promise of things getting better and the democratization of culture and uh, the public sphere um and yet on the other hand uh you know the rise of misogyny the rolling back of women's rights so these pa this paradox is also happening in this in <clears throat> in the domain of gender and there are some scholars who point to these really interesting, uh, this really interesting and complex moment. So Sarah Bene Weiser um, argues that contemporary media culture is really marked by what she calls popular feminism. So it's a feminism which has which has now become cool, which is now taken up by celebrities. Um, so feminism, incredibly, um, has become popular in recent years. And for those you know who have longer memories you know um feminism you know 10 years ago was distinctly uncool was, was not was something which was often disavowed by celebrities um whereas now it's cool to be feminist um and then this is we see this in the kind of advertising industry as well um and sarah benny weiser points to a growing self-esteem industry which targets girls and women which is encouraging them to be confident which is encouraging encouraging them to have a voice um um, Rosalind Gill and Shani Orgad um, talk about the rise of confidence culture, where girls and women are not just invited to be confident, not just encouraged to be confident, but actually almost kind of mandated to be confident, like you must be confident, you must come forwards, you must kind of speak out and, um, um, and kind of promote your own self brand in contemporary culture. And so they argue that the kind of idealized mode of femininity now is actually is actually to be confident is actually to speak up to be kind of assured to be resilient to be uh to be publicly visible which again is historically different to to what we've what the idealized modes of femininity um that we've that we've seen so overall i think we can say that it, it, in contradistinction to earlier periods, women and girls are now impelled to speak up, to speak out and to find their voice. So we're all encouraged to kind of um, to come forwards as citizens, um, to be confident, to be resilient, to be publicly visible. Um, and yet um, there are also real costs to doing this, you know, misogynistic backlash, uh, public humiliation, which are often uh, um, linked to, 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 to having this kind of public visibility. Um, okay, so um, could I just check in and see how how much time I have, just so that I don't um, I, I make sure not to not to run over. No, it's fine. I guess uh, 15, 20 minutes more, no problem. Then we can go for the question session. Great, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, okay, and this brings me then to to um, to me too, um, because obviously one of the ways in which women and girls' voices have been understood as really coming to the fore in recent years has been um, with me too. So, um, and this is you know me too is a complex uh, transnational phenomenon. There are you know there there are lots of different kinds of texts um, and genres associated with me too, and this is just one, but I think it's an important one. Um, and this is um, Me Too Rising, which uh, 
which is um, a website created uh, by Google Trends, which seeks to kind of map and visualize the movement um, on, a, on a global scale. So you go onto the website and it lights up um, with this kind of revolving globe showing where people are participating and using the Me Too hashtag on a global scale. And it kind of shows you know, that, it, that it's, happening, it's happening all over the world. Um, and then the next thing to come up on the website um, are, the, are these lines of poetry um, taken by a poem by uh, Muriel Ruxeyer. Um, and these lines, I think, are really, really significant, um, the fact that they've been used. And they're often used by lots of other Me Too activists in other contexts as well. Um, and the words are, um, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life? Um, the world would split open. And I think these lines resonate very powerfully in this Me Too era. Um, and they point to this whole world of um, repressed or unspoken stories um, about hurt and trauma and abuse, um, which are overwhelmingly done <clears throat> to women. Um, but they also suggest, and I think this is really important, they also suggest that these stories have this kind of latent and simmering power um, and that women's testimonies and disclosures could very well rupture the world or split it open, um, no less. Um, and these lines of poetry suggest that women's uh, disclosure will be uh, transformative, that it will be powerful, that for women to speak up and to, and to break the silence will change the world utterly, finally and irreversibly. Um, and arguably, in, in the context of the Me Too Rising website, um, the citation of these poetic words suggests that maybe this radical breach, this rupture, this splitting open um, has already happened. Because as we can see from, um, from the globe, what, more than one woman has told the truth about her life. You know, thousands upon thousands of women have, have used the Me Too hashtag, have, have disclosed um, traumatic uh, um, uh, stories of, of abuse and trauma. You know, this has already happened. And so this speaks, I think, to, you know, a, a very kind of, I guess, optimistic idea that just by simply by speaking out, simply by telling a story about what's happened to you will will bring about justice. Um, but of course, um, as we know, uh, Me Too, you know, well, I, and this is, I think, what it would be interesting to talk about is, you know, what, what has Me Too done? You know, has... Uh, has the world split open in this way? Um, and of course, for many feminists, um, it's been extremely disheartening and disappointing to see, uh, uh, you know, how structures of power, uh, patriarchal power, um, have been relatively unscathed, I would say, by uh, even after this global kind of this global movement. And so some uh, um, feminist critics and other critics um, have been very, I guess, critical about Me Too. And there are many very different kind of um, forms of critique of Me Too. And, and this is just one. <clears throat> and this is Susan Watkins writing um, in the New Left Review in 2018. Excuse me. And she's talking mostly, writing mostly about the US context. Um, but she says, Me Too seems to have done little to an address an agenda that would tackle that would tackle the enabling conditions for sexual harassment. So these are precarious work, racialized gender stereotypes and criminalized migrant status. Um, so she says the Weinstein business, so in, in the kind of Hollywood uh, um, context of Me Too, this provided the opportunity for a root and branch attack on the culture industry. Instead, Hollywood has been pinkwashed by the parade of feminist activists across the red carpet, uh, wiping away the stain on its reputation. Um, and having removed a few bad apples, Me Too risks leaving the wider system um, as it is. So she's obviously talking about Hollywood there, and I'd be interested to know what, what, uh, what similarities there might be with, with, the, um, with the Indian context here. Um, but really her critique there is that Me Too has, has, has has failed to a significant degree because it's just focused on on picking out bad apples um, in targeting individuals and not looking at the broader structural conditions which have enabled this kind of uh, this kind of abuse to flourish. Um, so 
she says that Me Too really sort of centralizes individuals rather than structures in a way which means that the, you know, the root causes of these kind of problems are never going to be never going to be tackled. Um, and so that me too and lots of other scholars have pointed to this as well saying that me too has not been connected to kind of revolutionary uh, movements which are about you know changing the material conditions of society changing you know the redistribution of um of wealth the um um the ownership um you know trying to actually dismantle those kind of broader structures which uh which underpin um um, which underpin the culture industry, which underpin other workplaces. So briefly, then, just to I'm um, uh, just to very briefly kind of um, summarize what some of the possibilities of Me Too might be, as opposed to uh, some of the potential problems of Me Too. So the potentialities um, or possibilities of Me Too, we might say, are that on the one hand, Me Too challenges patriarchal and challenges these patriarchal imperatives for women to be silent so you know if we've seen that you know women's silence has been idealized um over a long long period of history then simply by speaking out particularly about gendered forms of abuse is in itself a radical act um uh because because it is it is it, I guess it's you could say it's a form of communicative justice, just in the fact that it's it's uh, demanding to be heard, um, particularly in an in a domain which uh, women have been, you know, it's politics. You have to have a materialist critique, understand um, how gender injustice um, operates. Um, but she also uh, points to. Uh, the, the politics of recognition. So this is the other strand of gender injustice. So these are harms which are which are related to representation, identity, and difference. And she calls this status subordination. And this can include things like um, like sexual harassment um, and domestic violence. So she sees these two things, these two forms of gender injustice, um, as as central to a politics of feminism, that you have to um, that you have to have a class analysis, but you also have to have an analysis um, of recognition. Um, what Nancy Fraser argues is that feminism um, in recent decades has lost its focus on redistribution. So it's lost its grounding in the left. It's lost its grounding in socialist politics, and has become an, a, um, a, with an analysis of class and, and economics. And it's and it's become very much focused on the politics of recognition. Um, so for her, contemporary feminism is is too often just focused on recognition and doesn't include a kind of materialist redistributive analysis within it. And so for Nancy Fraser and I think other feminists, um, something like Me Too has to be connected to a broader movement for economic justice. Um, for for the redistribution think other feminists um something like me too has to be connected to a broader movement for economic justice um for for the redistribution of power and wealth um because without that redistribution for justice and i would say communicative justice having a voice um is not is not possible without that kind of without that connection to uh to materially changing well to, to changing the material conditions um and structures um of society um okay so Julie, yes uh, uh just to just five minutes more perhaps then we can go for the questions if that's fine that's great thank you very much thank you for the uh for the um the the uh the the warning that's great um okay so um I was going to uh, talk about uh, this example, and I'll just really briefly mention it. Um, so this is just one example, I think, of something which was very much celebrated in the context of Me Too, which is the stand-up show Nanette by um, by Hannah Gadsby. Um, I obviously haven't, haven't got time to, to go into it too much now, but I've, I have written about it and I'd be very happy to share um, to share my writing with this if anybody would like, would like to see it. Um, but briefly, what I wanted to say about this is that this was really, really celebrated um, as a form of um, of feminist justice, of of of, of somebody get, having meaningful voice um, within the public sphere, as a kind of as something which, if we go back to the earlier slide, which kind of split the world open. Um, 
So Hannah Gadsby's uh, Netflix special Nanette um, is a study in female anger and recovery. Uh, it, it's sort of it's for stand up to confront the Me Too era. It was seen to have this incredible, powerful force, which was really going to change comedy, which was going to change the world. Um, and in many ways, you know, I mean, I personally was a big, big, big fan of the the um, of of this of this show. But there were lots and lots of critics which point who pointed out to the fact that, well, yes, this, you know, in some ways, you know, it's it's really, really important for people to be telling their stories, to be voicing their trauma, to be, you know, telling their own stories in their own words. And yet what what these kind of optimistic narratives miss out is the fact that, you know, th this was produced um, on Netflix. And and if we want to think about meaningful communicative justice and meaningful voice and the democratization of voice, we have to think about this kind of, you know, about the the architectures of global global media corporations, which many people argue are undermining voice, are undermining um, democratic media or the possibility of democratic media. So really, uh, I guess my point really is is that we need to I guess focus on the on on the structures of ownership when it comes to the media you know that's really also really important when it comes to thinking about voice and about you know democratizing voice and giving voice to everybody um and so then just i will just come to my last uh slide so i guess what i would argue is that we need to have a, a materialist conceptualization of voice um so that feminism has has this kind of re has a renewed commitment to materialist politics not just to jettison the politics of recognition altogether uh, that's that's an incredibly important part of feminism you know to recognize um uh to recognize you know the importance of of identity, the importance of representation, the importance of recognition, but also I think that has to be connected to uh, a politics, a materialist politics, which is about uh, redistributing uh, wealth and power, um, because that is that that is what is fundamentally undermining democracy, um, giving rise to the conditions which allow which are allowing forms of gendered abuse um, to happen. Um, so I think finding a voice should be about democratizing the means of communicative production um, as well as you know as as hearing each other's stories um, and um, and being able to to speak in public um, so i'll i'll leave it there um, but yes thank you very much and i'm really really happy to um, to take questions i'm very interested to take questions and particularly how these questions may or may not kind of relate to uh, uh, you know things that you've been thinking about yourselves um in in the context that that you are in so thank you very much indeed hi julie there are a few questions in the chat box uh you can see it yourself or otherwise we can read it for you whichever you want oh i see thank you okay so um Okay, so there's quite a lot of questions. <laughs> um, right, yeah. So, would you, would do you want to sort of pick out a couple that I could answer, or, or I can try and answer all of them? Uh, whichever you want. Do I? Uh, we can start with a question that we have received uh, in YouTube uh, live streaming. Uh, so then we can come the questions uh, that is posted here. So one of the questions posted at YouTube was. Has Me Too brought a sort of strife between two competing notions of feminism, social and individual? Sorry, can you repeat that again? Sure. Has Me Too brought a sort of strife between two competing notions of feminism, social and individual? Oh, that's a very, very good question. Um, I guess I guess uh, it could be seen to have kind of thrown into very uh, sharp relief these potentially competing uh, notions of justice, um, which I guess which Nancy Fraser would which would characterise as the politics of redistribution or social uh, sort of uh, focus on questions of the social um, and then also recognition and or potentially you know to focus on the individual. Um, so I would say it's thrown it into really sharp relief. Um, I guess what I would say is that I think when um, at its best, what Me Too, you know, what Me Too did 
or has done or might do is to kind of synthesize those things so it's um it's it's not just one or the other so that a feminist a feminist I th and i think this is the challenge for me too and for feminism more broadly is to is to ends of justice together so that the politics of identity and the politics of recognition is really really important um and i and there are lots of people identity politics or the politics of recognition is sort of meaningless of injustice that is not as important as you know as the social or redistribution um but i for me uh feminism has to find a way of bringing those two things together and not seeing them as kind of as two separate forms of justice so i think what me too when me what me too where where me too was most successful or most powerful was when it had an economic critique um as well so that was would be my answer i guess that i think it's important and it's not it's not always easy but i think it's really important to try and synthesize or bring together those two strands of justice okay uh, the next question, I guess, is one of, from our students, so Shomili Bishar. Uh, she is asking a very short, simple question, and with which I'll add some of mine also. Uh, she is, her question is, ma'am, has Me Too improved everything? And with that, I would like to add to that, uh, what is your ta take on the, uh, this post-colonial concept? of uh, the third wave uh, feminism particularly and how the post-colonial feminism or subaltern studies how do you think it has uh, been addressed through this me too movement if any wow okay so so those are two different questions right <laughs> um i guess well like I guess the question about has Me Too improved everything uh, or nothing um, is a very sort of generative and interesting question. And I think it's important to, to keep on debating that because think about, you know, not to just dismiss it as a complete failure or to say that, you know, that it hasn't changed anything because of course it has changed something, um, but, but obviously not enough. And it's obviously, uh, you know, we're seeing a kind of incredible backlash in some ways again, if, uh, the the raising of of women's voices um so i mean i mean i guess i'm more interested to know what other people think about that about how optimistic other people feel about um about media culture and politics and society in in the kind of post me too context and whether whether other people feel like uh uh like you know feel hopeful about that and because personally i kind of oscillate all the time between hope you know possibility and thinking that there is no possibility so i guess i'm very interested to know um what what uh what others might think about that um and the question was about about um about third wave feminism and subaltern studies so it was that, yes was that, was that yes 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 the post-colonial concept okay so i guess that means i guess the question then uh uh, in what in what think about me too uh, so is that in relating so, to right so uh, if, as uh, Shomili was asking that has improved everything so how diffused it were in in the different layers of the society that's uh, something I want to uh, look into was it just restricted to some sections of the society? You have mentioned few of the points in the criticism also, and a very capitalist take on the Me Too concepts that you have touched on. So how diffused was the impact of it in the different layers of the society? Um, oh, very good question. Um, so I suppose, um, you know, um, one of the most significant critiques i guess of me too is that it really uh, it didn't really get beyond this sort of upper strata of uh, of society and and it and it it was really very focused particularly in the kind of media representation of me too anyway it was very focused on high profile uh, white celebrities um um in the us um and and that and that actually in in other contexts um where women who have much less kind of power and privilege um 
those kind of domains, you know, like precarious work, insecure work, uh, people who have um, insecure migrant status, um, people, uh, poor women, uh, women who, you know, who, who, who were already kind of deeply marginalised, um, were the ones who, who, who I guess who have got fewest of the benefits of um, of of Me Too, um, and so I suppose this this links to um, some of the uh, the critiques of, of of Me Too, which are that you know that it unless you really challenge the kind of the the capitalist racist organisation of um, of world politics of 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 the economy um that will not meaningfully change or improve the lives of, of of most people so i guess i guess in that sense you could argue i mean and so a lot of so um alison phipps has argued that me too in its in its dominant form was a form of um political whiteness um because it centralized the experiences of privileged uh white women in the global north um and did very very little to I guess challenge the structural injustices which uh, <clears throat> uh, which would which would be able to uh, which you know to meaningfully challenge those deep structural injustices that would be the way to liberate most women um, and so yeah so I guess in that sense it's been seen as a form of political whiteness because it it's 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 not challenging the kind of the economic uh um basis of inequality thanks that was very interesting explanation so do you uh, just one take that if you have if you allow we can take one last question okay this is from shubhoji tacharya uh his question is madam i have a question uh, does me too movement can change the perspective of society towards women and also, how can we improve gender equality in today's society? Wow. Okay. Good question. Um, also, a very big question. Um, so, I guess, I mean, I suppose what Me Too can do, I think, uh, and maybe maybe has done, and I again, I'd be very interested to know what what others think, is to uh, is to kind of raise awareness about questions around um, consent, um, around about power and how it can be abused. Um, you know, it and some people have argued that it has made some kind of tangible change in workplaces, for example, where sexual harassment is taken more seriously. You know, and then we can think about, you know, to what extent is that, you know, is that actually borne out by evidence? But at least, you know, there are, you know, there are, you know, a lot of, uh, and you know, and a lot of men were punished and uh, and lost their jobs, and perpetrators were, uh, in some cases, brought to some kind of justice. Um, so there has been some change, and I guess I wouldn't want to suggest that that, that there's been no that there's that no movement has happened, that there's you know that nothing has budged, because clearly something has budged, and and perceptions at least. And I guess the possibility of women speaking out to each other and 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 you know and sharing forms of um, sharing stories um, of abuse and trauma has become more possible in in many contexts um, and yet I guess for me I think uh, for me improving um, gender equality you know uh, has to be linked to you know to to to, to other other movements um, for for social justice for 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 economic justice for climate justice um, so for me, I think um, gender equality, I guess I would say gender equality is not possible within the existing system. Or you could you could have equality between some men and some women, but the system itself is still so rotten and and unjust that that, is, that to me is not the true meaning of feminism. Um, and so to have, I think, meaningful gender equality also means, you know, to have gender justice has to be linked to, yeah things like climate justice, things like economic um, justice. Um, and uh, but always with an insistence um, that uh, 
that I guess uh, women and other marginalized groups are not sidelined in those in those broader movements as well. So I think feminism has to kind of keep these things in tension and, and remain in, ten in productive tension, but also solidarity and coalition with other forms of um, with other form other social justice movements. So I guess that would be my answer. And um, sorry, it's very broad and abstract. But I, to me, that I think that's what's really at stake. And I think it's what's really important for, for feminism. Thank you so much, Lily. That was very, very interesting indeed. Uh, so thank you so much for your presentation and uh, for this excellent explanations of very so many queries. And I'm sorry to all the uh, questions, all of these participants who are putting forward so many questions, we couldn't take it due to lack of time. Uh, so I'll call now uh, Tomosha, one of our former colleagues, to end the keynote address session. Thanks again, Jilly. Yes, Tomosha, over to you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tamisha Ghosh, Faculty Journalism and Mass Communication. First of all, I would like to thank Julie, ma'am, for such an enlightening speech, ma'am. We wish we could hear you more. We are grateful to you for your gracious presence. You have introduced us to a new concept today of communicative injustice, which is extremely relevant in today's time. You also mentioned about histories of women's silence and that there is a culturally awkward relationship between women and public sphere of speech making, debate and comment to celebrating women's voices in the contemporary world. We are thankful to you for being with us on such a short notice. And you know you gave us areas to ponder. I, on behalf of Women's College Calcutta, would like to extend our sincere gratitude to you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you Moving. so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Moving on. We would now like to begin today's plenary. I would like to introduce the chair of the plenary, Dr. Fatima N. Dr. Fatima N is an assistant professor at AJK Mass Communication Research Center, Jamia Mila Islamia. She has worked with the pilot team of Times Now and has received an inlet scholarship to do an MA in Screen Academy. Her documentary, Talking Heads, was screened at various national and international film festivals. She's a recipient of Center for Research and Education in Arts and Media, Studentship for Doctoral Research from University of Westminster, London, Film Fellowship from Public Service Broadcasting Trust, India, and National Geographic's All Roads Seed Grant. Her research interests include practice-based research, documentary film, and humor studies. We also have in the panel today with us, Ms. Ruchika Negi. She's a filmmaker and educator with an interest in creative and participative pedagogical practices. Her films include Every Time You Tell a Story, Malagao Times. She occasionally teaches film at the Ashoka University, Sonpat. Currently, she is associate editor at The Third Eye, a project of Niranta Trust that works on the intersections of gender, sexuality, education, and technology. We also have with us Ms. Neha Chopra, who is currently the head of marketing at GoAir, and has around 16 years of work experience with industries in advertising and worked in areas of brand strategy and communication strategy. She has also keen interest in designing brand strategies for startups, especially on the ones that's, that works on the areas of social impact. We also have with us Ms. Asha Paul, who's currently the director and producer with Vice. Through her journalistic work, she has been covering and exploring stories that talk about sex, caste, politics, crime, and the human condition. She's a journalist and a documentary filmmaker for the past eight years in various news and media organizations. Now, over to you, Fatima Ma'am. Thanks a lot, Tamasa, and uh, great to have you, Ruchika, Neha, and Isha. So I would first like to begin with Isha. Uh, uh, so, Isha, like, you know, so you have been working as a journalist, you know, so our key theme today is how does, what is the industry narrative, you know, about women being in journalism. So can you talk about it from your own experiences? You know, how has it been for you? Um, uh, it's been great because I also entered at the, I was a a student in MCRC where uh, Fatima taught uh, in 2010 and 12, to 12. So I've been a young entrant to the industry uh, while I started with television where there is 
something that we'll talk about later there is a certain kind of a glass ceiling that exists but later on when i sh uh, shifted to digital media i found um that there were women who were in uh, roles of leadership uh, they were and that's something that we have studies about as well um so for me personally uh, finding a the cusp of time that i entered media was a time when media was open to a higher representation of studies uh, or articles videos and documentaries about um both um, things that are close to me which are things about feminism and gender studies but also about uh, having people like me be on the field covering um, matters and beats which are considered um, hard and have been um, a uh, long been relegated to um mostly male counterparts so where women were more uh, in tune with the soft beats a uh, lifestyle um fashion culture uh, i feel like uh, the boom of industry that we saw in the past few in the past decade actually has made a space for women like me uh, to find a voice for themselves uh, especially so in digital media thank you isha so i would i would like to direct the next question to ruchika so ruchika you've come from a slightly earlier time than isha so and also you have been working with like you know filmmaking art and also the intersection of technology technology and social work so there is there, there are a lot of women in these fields right now we see quite a few women so uh, do you think that necessarily leads to a better coverage of women issue or is it only an issue of representation of having n number of women there what do you think yeah i think that's actually a very very interesting question fatima both i think as a practitioner for myself and uh, as a teacher and i think as a woman practitioner from all these uh, you know points of view Uh, i mean i would agree that actually yeah uh, particularly i think in our field like when you're working in film or art or anything cultural i think the uh, the questions may be perhaps a slightly different from mainstream at least on the surface because uh, uh, notionally it perhaps it's it's slightly more uh, fluid let's say this platform you know uh, but having said that i think uh, and like we were talking earlier today i think there is this whole uh, so i i find a lot of uh, cultural producers a lot of uh, artist workers a lot of like uh, cultural heads today who are women or filmmakers who are women uh, but i feel like the questions lie somewhere else i don't think even today it's an easy choice uh, for a young person uh, be it frankly a male or a female but particularly if you're a woman uh, it's not an easy choice to come into the cultural sector uh, you know and i think it's precisely because so common and so fluid uh, so a kind of uh, like and uh, you know the young who are my students who are like 23 22 much perhaps the audience today uh, at the college students today uh, a lot of them have this question at the time uh, you know when after they finish the course where they want to go out and do different things uh, but there is a huge thing from uh, pressure from parents right because there is no so called security um, your timings are odd it's not a, a, a very conventional 9 to 5 kind of uh, uh, work scene so i think a lot of young people do have to negotiate this at the level of learning and practicing but having said that i also feel that uh, i mean it's good to see a lot of people uh, a lot of women working and creating work uh, but i don't necessarily feel that that addresses this whole idea of uh, an egalitarian gender representation i think a lot of women when they are working and particularly in the mainstream of any kind whether it's the art mainstream or the media mainstream or the film mainstream uh, i think one is actually forced to take recourse to certain stereotypes uh, you know so even while you're working as a woman on a certain kind of a cultural production and a representation you perhaps end up uh, getting tied up in the same stereotypical kind of image making and representation you know so i do feel that this is something that is quite important uh, to sort of think about yeah thanks ruchika so now now we can go to neha and neha you feel this slightly different from isha and ruchikas you are with pr and also uh, you know with pr there is like a huge importance given to networking so how easy do you think is it for a young woman to enter and what is the perception of that the industry has about the women you know and is there any specific challenges that you have faced your voice is muted neha 
your voice is muted i'm sorry i'm sorry so thank you for this question and i think uh, you know i have uh, addressed this question and discussed it and debated it in a lot of forums official and unofficial so my uh, area of operations and expertise is uh, not just pr i have Actually, I think, uh, like Isha also mentioned somewhere, there are quite, there are few profiles in this industry which you know it is usually stereotyped. Women will excel at because it's about networking, uh, you know, uh, which which somehow people feel, uh, you know, women have easy access to because you know they know how to put on good makeup. But I would actually say that uh, you know. Um, and and to a certain extent i agree that women are very good at networking i think better than men and not because they put on good makeup but because uh, generally i think we are very sincere in our uh, interactions with people so the networking comes to us very naturally because we are the net, we are the people who really keep families together we know how to network within laws and extended in laws and family and everyone to keep everyone happy and together so yeah i think it's something which is true to every industry not just pr and advertising that uh, it is important to network and uh, you know that sometimes and you know there was a time when it was very difficult for women to kind of network and i also kind of Kind of used to hear, uh, you know, from my senior colleagues uh, and sometimes from the industry peer that because women are not so much into smoking or late night partying, etc. You know, which are some which were sometimes considered as the binders of. Or, or you know the tools to kind of network with men in the industry uh, you know it became became a little difficult but i don't think i have had those kind of challenges and even if there were certain organizations or industries uh, you know where i saw that kind of happening rampantly i could figure out other tools to kind of network because at the end of the day your client or your agency is looking at uh, you know uh, uh, you to do good business and at you to sincerely work for your clients and uh, you know that uh, is something which you need to bring to the table whether you are a man or a woman and if you are really able to do that i don't think it becomes an issue or a limitation in any way so that's what i would i kind of uh, you know put it as yeah Thanks, Neha. So now, now I have a question for all the three panelists. So whoever would like to go first, please go, uh, because the, this is a question about the glass ceiling. Very often, you see a lot of girls entering the profession, you know, especially the media profession, but you hardly see many people at the top, you know. So there is, is there a glass ceiling in your fields, or is is there is is there a wage gap? So what has been your experience? Who would like to go first? So I would maybe you okay. know, the last yeah. person speaking. Yeah, I think uh, the glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. Uh, also exists in the media industry and i think uh, ruchika also kind of mentioned when she said that it is very challenging uh, at times for women to work in the cultural sector uh, you know and you know uh, the other industries of the media as such but i think that's a problem which is prevalent across industries it's not just the media industry alone which kind of uh you know witnesses this phenomenon of women uh, you know uh, you know ma uh, making an effort to break this uh, glass ceiling so to say but uh, i would also like to say that you know i have seen uh, many of women break many a glass ceiling in the advertising and media industry in the last um, you know last few years and uh, you know with, with the kind of campaigns that we have seen in the last few uh, years where there has been a radical shift about how women are not uh, you know sitting ducks to take any kind of discrimination coming their way has only worked in our favor you know it has uh, it has put a lot of moral and social pressure on the industries and the companies to give equal opportunity to women but i would not like to give the credit to these movements i would like to give the credit of this to the women themselves who have really worked very hard to establish credentials uh you know to to do some excellent work in their uh, respective fields to be able to break these glass ceilings and to earn this on their own merit so that's how i would uh, you know like to see this thanks neha 
So, Isha or Richa Gafford, like, yeah, Isha. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, when we talk about glasses, ceiling and uh, considering all of us work with data in our uh, jobs um the fact is that uh, in india when they did a report like there was a report uh, un and news had done a report together about gender inequality they figured that uh, less than 5% or so uh, women were in leadership positions so that means someone who's an editor in chief executive editor head of a bureau or such you know like editor positions and this has been across so we have data to show us uh, from all the top com companies that exist uh, uh, and these are like 13 newspapers eight uh, television channels uh, national level that um, women are grossly underrepresented in leadership positions and that is a glass ceiling we are yet to break and are far away from it um if it's okay for me to quote a little bit more data i would just say that traditional media also that you're looking at uh, tv channels would have only one in five uh, leaders would be women uh, for magazine it's 13 percent digital it's a bit more but i feel like uh, digital because the internet is an ever expanding space somehow it's been easier for women to invade that space as well um when it comes to all of that uh, it's the glass ceiling doesn't only exist on the upper level glass ceiling also in a very uh, weird way and this uh, uh, this is where personal experiences come in is where um, even in the mid-level category that you would be uh, let's say I'm a deputy editor of uh, an international organization but I also would be someone who fa faces uh, pay gap disparity with my male colleague and this doesn't just happen uh, because me saying that I have a pay gap doesn't end the conversation there because for uh, an organization that pay gap has come from the fact that for the past few years, the male has been paid more, the female has been paid less. We are paying you on your earlier salary. These are all uh, small conversations that they say. And women ourselves, like this is something that uh, HR ex executives have found. Um, I was working on a doc about uh, pay, uh, like uh, imposter syndrome in women working in tech as well recently. So uh, there is an imposter syndrome that um, people have noticed, uh, HR executives have noticed that women carry with them where uh, if you don't have the 100% capability of filling up a role, you might not raise your hand for it, while a male counterpart would. And um, just the fact that uh, sometimes we just don't know how to get away from all the patronizing bhashan that you get around in your uh, workspace as well. And to break all of this, at a singular level, sure, uh, all of us are trying to break into, uh, women are natural born protesters. Uh, we have been protesting all through our lives. So. For students who are there, all of us have personal stories where we have at some point, uh, let's say you have uh, some point for small bad habits and vices like smoking a cigarette or having a boyfriend to having marrying the person of your choice, doing the job of your choice, uh, choosing the life that you want um, of your choice. We have been protesting all this while. So yes, at an individual level, I guess that is what we do for the glass ceiling where we women enter the workforce. but for a glass ceiling to break, it is an industrial uh, movement that is required. And um, I think um, BBC had this 50-50 project where over two years, secretly, a BBC boss decided that he's just going to hire 50% women. And when he hired 50% women, he saw that. Now, all the responses that were coming from people uh, for news shows, there was a, like a jump and like a percentage jump of women calling in to talk about their um issues grievances or even things that have been happening in their neighborhood just a representation change on screen mattered in a way that the collection of data and collection of uh, voices changed as well and this is something so important because of the fact that it's not just about women in media breaking the glass ceiling it's also the way we um women in media end up pulling in other women to get their voices across where the narrative changes from only talking about women when we're talking about extreme cases of violence. Now, as we've noticed in the past few years, uh, the conversation around gender is becoming or uh, in a wider sphere, like even on Instagram, something like that. I mean, we have had papers for years, but even in a normal uh, conversation, the, the discussion around gender has become more um, nuanced because of the fact that uh, 
um, more women uh, naturally means uh, that uh, our stories or stories of uh, an entire gender can now have the nuance that it needs from the people who tell it. So in that way, I think uh, the glass ceiling needs to be broken from up top. But yeah, we're doing our little parts in it. Thanks, Isha. And Ruchika, what has been your experience with it? So actually, like I said, I think I'm coming from a very different spectrum. Uh, I mean, the field is actually so uh, fluid is the only word I can think of. But I do feel that. So you know, I don't think like in uh, like an independent creative practice. Uh, the glass ceiling is actually uh, a very complicated thing. It's a, it's a set of many, many things. And gender perhaps is one aspect of it. Uh, so in a sense, I feel yeah, there's a, there are some freedoms here, which over the years actually I've come to respect quite a lot, especially when I look at like other work scenarios. But having said that, I think, uh, so rather than, you know, sort of responding to, the, to this as a glass ceiling concept, I'd like to kind of think of uh, a lot of friends, say women, uh, colleagues, who, for instance, like what happens uh, once you have a family or once you have children and you decide to continue to practice, you know? So what are the, and I sometimes, and I'm not saying, and I'm also like uh, a lot of friends are, uh, come, are very strongly rooted in a certain feminist tradition. So there's a way they've, they've maneuvered or they've negotiated their domestic and professional spaces, you know, with change in status of who they are, or whether they're mothers, whether they're caregivers or whatever roles that they've taken on. But having said that, I don't know if that sort of a negotiation happens as much, say, with male colleagues, uh, you know. So, for instance, like what a man typically, and I'm thinking of my male friends, when they were to so-called settle down, uh, you know, what are the changes that they are making in that sense, right? So, I think this is an ongoing conversation, and I'm not at all here uh, uh, playing the victim card, not at all. I think all these women who made choices to be caregivers or to be nurturers have made very informed uh, choices in a certain way. But having said that, I think, yeah, I mean, as a, you know, the stereotype that a woman is a certain way and she can take more and she can therefore like sort of, you know, she's like this uh, sponge who can like do things in a certain way. I do feel that that to a certain extent is, you know, it's true. I feel it within myself. Uh, but having said that, I also feel and something that Isha brought up in another way. I feel this is also a very exciting time because, uh, uh, you know, this, this whole thing that, and I'm not a very uh, tech savvy person, I don't really do Instagram and all of that very often, but very often I see these uh, very everyday actions that women do. Uh, now they be they've become a part of their personal image making or whatever, image narrative on, uh, you know, these online platforms. And by that, I mean like simple things like, you know, people doing cookery shows, especially now during lockdown. And I actually find it fascinating or somebody doing embroidery or somebody knitting. Uh, you know, and a lot of it is on Instagram or you find it on Facebook or I don't know what are the other platforms. And I think this is, these are, most of them are first time users or they're young people. And sometimes they're not so young, you know, like recently, and this has been uh, going the rounds, this young girl who's done this amazing thing on Instagram where she's playing with a hoopla and she's wearing a sari. And this is a video that's been circulating. And I think it's fascinating, you know, so I think there are also, uh, uh, well, subversion is too big a word, but there are, there are also movements which are happening. Uh, which in a, in a way like, you know, this whole idea that feminists uh, believe in that the everyday is important. The spectacle is not what is the most important. I think these are extensions that you're seeing now among young people, older women uh, through these platforms, you know, and I think that's very, very exciting. Uh, it also makes you realize that maybe our debates are a little stultified, like, you know, there's more, the gender is like way more complicated than ever right now uh, because of the all kinds of access that we have because technology also uh, uh, you know, it also it's also kind of uh, promoting, say, I'd say, like on, on the bad side, stuff like you know, pornographic content. So there's also that kind of downside to it. But I think there's also a certain um, engagement or a self-expression that these platforms have allowed uh, women and young women, old women, all kinds of women to access, which I think is so exciting, actually. So I think our glass ceiling today, to a lot of extent, in the area that I work in, um, I would say is in our head. And in our conditioning, you know, yeah. Uh, Ruchika, I would like to ask you one more question. So in the way you were talking about, yeah, this is typically internationally the thing given, like why there is a glass ceiling, they say women leave uh, to have families, etc. So you yeah. are suggesting that it is as much about the families as well, you know, yeah. 
yeah. the parenting becomes a woman's job you know and taking care of the house becomes a woman's job as you were saying like you know whether their your male friends life is not affected in in that particular way which ties up to what isha was saying also about the acts of everyday resistance which you were also suggesting so yeah. how do you think that you know is is it a move which is needed within the family or is it within the industry what do you feel well i think it starts actually within yourself then within the family and then uh, outside you know i mean again like for instance if i think of my women friends who've made this decision uh, it's not been easy and there's also been as if you diet and as liberal as their male partners may have been it's been a series of conversations you know particularly motherhood it's been a series of negotiations and conversations and the, uh, and the, at some level i mean i wouldn't say men don't change at all they do that's a bit unfair i mean they also take on their share of responsibilities but i think once the woman is confident and once you have you know you have a certain kind of a comfort zone which is true for anything within the domestic then actually this question becomes at least you're ready to fight this question let's say you know just that uh now i would like to go to neha neha i also want to ask you know uh, how easy is it to, uh, for a woman coming from a, a very different background like you know for a young girl who wants to enter the profession so what would be your advice to that person to reach where you are you know so is it particularly easy for only certain kinds of women so you know what is what is the journey been like yeah so i think uh, you know one of the things uh, you know you're right uh, you know we are uh, i don't know about ruchika and isha that but you know we've been uh, we've grown in metros and i think uh, you know there is a certain kind of an advantage that we get uh, growing up uh, you know in the metro cities uh, you know uh, being in touch with the people around us and you know being with the kind of audience you know which might help us later to reach where we want to in our professional lives but i think uh, you know ruchika made a very pertinent point uh, you know where she said that you know technology has been a great leveler you know it has really uh, you know expanded the scope of uh, opportunities uh, you know to people far and beyond and and you know that holds true for the women also and you know when it comes to so i mean for example a woman uh, you know in in a smaller town will have equal access to a linkedin uh you know or any other networking group that she can be a part of to network with the right kind of people and uh you know uh learn more about the industry she wants to get into the people working in that industry etc etc and i would really like to say that i think it is also uh, you know on us as uh, uh, you know it, it's a responsibility that we as women also kind of need to have to uh, you know support uh, you know our uh, you know women folk so to say you know men are always great when it comes to bonding you know they really uh, huddle and they really stand uh, by and uh, you know um, stand by each other so you know at that something which as women bring more and more women for women, you know to pan or uh, you know to let them uh, coincide with the opportunities at the right place and at the right time but answering your question about uh, you know is it difficult or you know how easy or difficult it is for uh, you know women from uh, different backgrounds i would say that they can really use uh, you know technology uh, you know as a big tool in all of this in fact uh, you know uh, when naruchika was speaking about uh, you know uh, uh, technology and social media giving uh, the opportunity to women to really uh, you know uh, talk about or express themselves in their own unique way uh, if you actually look at that you know you will see that even in the film industry for example or in the media industry i see uh, a larger influx of women coming from smaller towns and different backgrounds than uh, you know uh, women who've grown in privileged uh, backgrounds uh you know and anyway karan johar is not a popular name anymore and he's taken a big beating for nepotism but uh, yes i think uh, technology is really giving uh, women from different backgrounds also an equal opportunity to uh, you know to make it easy for them to uh, join the mainstream industry yeah you are on mute uh, fatima 
sorry uh, i would like to uh, ask one question to isha and after that we could start the questions so if anybody has any questions i'm sure you have questions please start typing it in the chat box so isha i wanted to ask you like you also work uh, you know you're working with wise asia team right so like you know how has your experience been like you work with indian media houses and now you're working with wider asia uh, region you know so how is the situation is the gender situation in indian newsrooms different from rest of asia what has been your experience so till now uh, so yes uh, while my head office is in brooklyn uh, because i'm part of bias there yeah, i look at the asia region like i make documentary films in different parts of asia uh, so um my experience when it comes to uh, gender inequality in media spaces uh, has uh, frankly been um, in an international news organization perhaps which has been under the preview of people looking at it thoroughly also uh, vice uh, to be fair i had a shady past where uh, me to be uh, vice was involved in me to uh, allegations as well there were three pre uh, producers in the us office who were called out for it so international organizations of that level and structure tend to be a bit more careful uh, about situations related to gender but from personal experience um um the it's not that different i mean the demons come out in different ways but uh, i feel like yes uh, under scrutiny uh, companies tend to work better for their people if there is less scrutiny for the corporations uh, that we are parts of uh, i feel that uh, they get away with a lot a uh, lot less and so the conversations around uh, if whether someone uh, would be uh, speaking a, a certain kind of english or looks a certain way or uh, the conversations around uh, whether they have the social security to be able to take uh, riskier uh, uh job choices they all kind of bundle up in the way that uh, we enter newsrooms and that happens in india as well yeah thanks ikha so let us start, uh, take the first question so maybe this this is more directed at you isha mm -hmm. somili vishwas asks how safe is it for a woman to be in crime journalism uh it's as safe as it is for a man um to be a crime journalist uh so i do make uh, films around crime that's one of the primary beats that i report on as well and uh, uh, conversations where other people including panels and including um, interviews uh, people do tend to uh, be astonished at the fact that uh, if you were if you're a woman how do you go to let's say up and talk to some gangsters uh, in the same way uh, uh, not to generalize uh, our entire gender but uh, Uh, there are certain qualities like uh, nia mentioned that women carry with them more so because of the way that we have been conditioned in our family structure as well where we can come across as disarming so i think uh, in a way works in some things work in our favor thanks isha ask uh, in, you know uh, ruchika uh, ruchika how different is the scene in documentary with fiction you know if somebody wants to enter doc, you know so how different are the scenes for women in both uh well actually uh, they are different and they're not i mean in the sense that i feel they're very different in uh, because documentary is unfortunately or fortunately and almost like an informal practice in our country there is very little it's very hard to do independent work uh, funding is very restricted but because of all those reasons uh, if you do if anybody decides to do the uh, do it anyway i think it's a lot of joy there's a lot of uh, latitude that one can enjoy uh, you know and but fiction of course and, and again going by like friends who work say even in bombay i think it's much more competitive much more cutting edge in fact if you had another filmmaker who was working in fiction right now she'd have a very different take on uh, what it means to be a woman and to be doing filmmaking i'm sure because that is a whole uh, new thing but having said that again i feel because of where we are today I feel there are a lot of people who are making, who are working in a hybrid form. So they're working in between fiction and non-fiction, and they're working with very small budgets because now cameras and like you know equipment allows you to be freer, and and uh, it's not that expensive as it used to be, say five six years ago. So I feel there are experiments that are happening even in art, for that matter, uh, because of again technological uh, changes that have happened over the years. 
But otherwise, if you're talking mainstream fiction, I think it's very different from documentary scene. Very, very different. Thanks, Ruchika. So next quick question, I think Neha, maybe you will be a good person to answer this. Is the perception of people changing about me women media professionals? Neha, what do you think? Neha, are you there? Yeah. I think she is having a connectivity issue, yeah. Neha, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm back. Yeah, yeah. You, sorry, yeah. Fatima. Yeah. yeah. Can you so, repeat the question? Yeah, the question is, is the perception yeah. about women media professionals changing now? You know, how are women perceived? Yeah, so I yeah. think... Uh, I think the perception will start changing the moment we ask, we stop asking the question that how are women professionals being looked at? Because I think it's high time that we start looking at ourselves as just professionals and not as men or women. And uh, I think that that I think is or, you know, is the ideal reality, uh, you know, when we talk about all these terms like uh, the glass ceiling, etc. Because I think uh, all the women who have been working in the industry for the last many years with their kind of hard work and the credentials that they have earned, you know, really helped us take away, uh, you know, this uh, or, you know, kind of erase this uh, need in fact of the question of how are women uh, professionals going to take it forward are they worth it are they capable enough they've really worked very hard uh, you know to really prove uh, to the world that they are no uh, you know they aren't behind in any way uh, as compared to their male counterparts and I think their perception in the media industry or any other industry for that matter is very strong you know I was actually watching uh, you know the whole cover and uh, around uh, you know New Zealand's uh, prime minister uh, prime minister and how she really handled the pandemic uh, you know at this situation and you know there was a very interesting post where someone said that you know let's really stop calling her as a woman who's in the seat of uh, running a country you know it is you know she is a leader whether it is a male or a female you know so I think that is something which we need to really bring uh, you know uh, you know into our consciousness to really stop looking at ourselves as female professionals or as women professionals but just look at us as professionals who are you know uh, in the driving seat of whatever profile or position that we are handling in an industry and that does not matter or the performance or the uh, you know the uh, the success factor or the uh, does not depend on our uh, does not depend on our gender anymore so that's how we really need to look at this reality i think thanks neha so the next question is an interesting one it's about like the digital divide at the home you know it's it, like you know many of you were talking about how social media is changing the scenario for women and like you know digital media is like a way in but this is also very true very often women's access to phones are policed you know the family will be constantly kiss about their eye on all that kind of stuff you know and and also in place times like this you also see when there is a pandemic there will be one smartphone in the house and who has access to it so how does one deal with it so um, both Isha and Ruchika, if you have any inputs on this. So actually, yeah, this is something which is uh, off late. This is the thing I'm most passionate about. Uh, so this whole, I absolutely agree, actually, Fatima, what you're saying. And I think this is a very pertinent question, particularly, I think, uh, in a non-city scenario, right? In a non-middle class, uh, in a reg in regular India, so to speak, in that scenario. Uh, who has the phone and who has the control i think the only way uh, to negotiate this is uh, i don't know is through i think the most important thing and it's a little old fashioned to say this but i think every woman whether young or old has to earn her own money because i think uh, wage makes a huge amount of difference wage is even today unfortunately uh, related to control and power uh, and the reason I say it is because, you know, I know this uh, uh, young set of girls in Lucknow, Muslim girls, it's an organization called Sadhavna Trust. And they're young Muslim regular uh, girls from a mohalla, you know, not like the educated urban women. And actually they have, uh, over the years, they've trained themselves in a certain kind of a filming, you know, film technology. 
and actually they run an entire uh, media based program these young girls who must be like 20 21 uh, who come from very regular uh, very repressive backgrounds like a lot of us also do in our own ways uh, you know but i feel like the reason they were, they were able to do this is because uh, over the years they just told them they have to make their own money and once you have the money um, then you know you can uh, fight let's say much more rigorously because you're not so insecure anymore in some ways so actually long term i feel that is the solution but uh, having said that we also know as we know right now i mean the connectivity all those other things you know it's not just uh, it's not a straight forward answer for this i will say i depend on our prime minister hopefully something will change he's been promising this for a long time digital india let's see where it goes i don't know <laughs> so yeah yeah and the next question i think both isha and uh, uh, iruchika you'll be able to answer, you know you will be able to respond to it in a better way like i think um, uh, as a documentary filmmaker how difficult is it you know how do people react to you uh, as a woman with a camera that's the question so isha would you like to go first i have like uh, never been anything else but a woman so i thought for me to actually answer that because i i haven't lived the reality of how it would be a, with a male i would say that uh because i've been, i've been working with organizations so when um a certain story is get, like a um, certain story is given to us uh, let's say i was covering the uh, aklak murder case so i i was going there to film it and uh, obviously they wanted to send an extra person along with us for our security make sure we're going a certain way there were 10 questions asked about are you okay with it as your family okay with it at some point someone had asked so this is uh, th- these are but these are things that you can get away with at uh, if you demand more uh, but uh, that is the hesitation that comes with a female employee i feel that they have it and actually at certain points as female employees you have to uh, demand these things as well like if you're sending me to a difficult uh, in a difficult position then please do provide the services uh, that are needed for my protection so um in that respect uh, maybe the male counterparts don't uh, face this situation uh, but apart from that uh, generally uh, i don't actually know how people react to it uh, aunties talk to me nicely and uh, so do uncles so it's been great ruchika what has been your experience also you have been training young camera people yeah no yeah. so actually this is very interesting uh, sukanya what you ask uh, and sudeshna um in very different ways but uh, i think like, it's interesting because i don't unlike isha i don't work in an organizational setup at all i work independently right so uh, it's interesting because uh, i think like as a woman you have an advantage and a disadvantage and as women i think we're very smart so we turn our disadvantages into so for instance if i am in a situation where there, there is a lot of male presence and it did happen once actually we were shooting in this uh, very uh, predominantly male town a working class town and i had a, a male colleague and i was actually told that you know we were shooting late at night and they told me very nicely not in any pejorative way but very uh, very like gracefully and nicely and uh, politely they told me that ye madam to raat mein nahi aayengi na sir aap hi aayenge shoot karne ke liye so it was an assumption you know but then of course you turn it into a joke and you say nahi bhai sahab aap kya bol rahe hain you know so as a woman i think uh, one is very good at all of this i'm sorry to be stereotyping again but so what i call using a woman card quite honestly and i use it quite often and quite blatantly because you have to uh, and secondly i also feel it's my class you know quite honestly i come from a certain class i speak i look a certain way even if i try and say for instance i don't know where salwar kurta chunni bindi all of that number to look like more acceptable my class is written on my body right so there's a way in which i think as a even when i was younger there's a way in which you can negotiate this it's very unfortunate to say it in today's time but i think it's a fact so um, so that but i do feel that there are times when i have felt a bit unsafe uh, you know and i have been very grateful that there has been a male uh, colleague up with me uh, for instance you know when there are crowded situations or like i don't know there have been in my professional life and those are just things that you negotiate yeah but i feel it's true for any profession you know i'm sure like a male colleague has felt equally vulnerable in a certain situation uh, you know so i think it's all yeah it's all very really weird i don't know if i'm answering your question but yeah yes yeah, so uh, people uh, tend to uh, i can sometimes be a little more shouty and aggressive to yeah. scare you uh, on field so uh, especially when you're doing uh, 
things that might bring me to go to a village or something like that. I, that happens uh, a bit. But yeah. uh, again, uh, as you said, uh, you tend to use your even passwords. That's uh, high my birth given right. So I would use it uh, and uh, get away with it. In yeah. fact, I would like to share something here. You know, I started my career as a journalist. So I remember that I was all of twenty uh, one years old, and uh, I was working for a newspaper called the Pioneer, and I was assigned the beat of Old Delhi. So the first story which I started working on was, uh, you know, it was a time when uh, the Tanga Walas were becoming extinct because obviously they were not allowed to. uh you know uh operate in a metro city like delhi and you know the old, old delhi also being a very crowded area they it had absolutely no space or place for a tanga wala so i started doing that story and when i spoke to the tanga walas they told me that you know uh, they are chaland left right and center by the police uh, men uh, and the police department so i remember i i went to the old delhi uh, police station which is darya ganj to speak to the policemen there on you know uh, whether what was the whole state or the plight of these tanga walas and why were they being chaland like that so after i finished all of this i went to my office to file my story and uh, you know my my boss who also happened to be a woman at that point in time she was heading the editorial of the sunday pioneer the department where i used to work and uh, i told her that this is my story and i have spoken to the tanga walas and then the police uh, men and she was like one second did you go to the police station all by yourself there was nobody else with you no photographer nobody and i said no ma'am and she was like so neha next time if you go to a police station and if you get raped pioneer will not be responsible for your safety so you know it came to me as a root shock and then she sat me down and explained that you are very you are very young you are enthusiastic and excited about your stories but you have to always be very careful as to what situation you know you might come across as very vulnerable or you get you might get into trouble so you know take it slow you have to call me first and you don't need to go to a police station to ask them about this you could have simply come to the office given them a call and taken their uh, you know court on the phone so you know i did learn that yes while i do want to assert the fact that you know i am free to go about anywhere and it doesn't matter whether i am a man or a woman because that was something which was always uh, you know i was that rebellious kind of a person at that age but you know i did learn to play safe i did learn that you know it is more important for me to do things and you know win in the long term than just you know rebel and protest at these things because i remember fighting with my editor for it that how can i not walk into a police station just because i am a woman and you know when she really explained me the whole thing you know i felt that yes you know i do need to really take these things into account because like uh, you know uh, ruchika mentioned that you know even men might come across vulnerable in certain situations so you know it's about also being wise and prudent i think uh, with which i learned uh, you know going uh, you know uh, as i grew old and wiser with age yeah yeah thanks neha i think that answers smith's question about like you know women journalists and challenges and as uh, neha was saying that it's not always a man or a woman thing also because if you look at the recent attacks it's the whole crew who gets attacked you know in man woman everybody included that is what is happening lately uh, and also next question i would like to direct it ruchika sneha has asked about what is the qualification one needs for rj but i would like to reframe this question i would like to ask how important is a media education to enter the field ruchika especially because you are a media educator do you think if you come with a degree as a woman you are in a particular advantage and if so which are the places where you should go for that kind of an education yeah so yeah definitely you know i would say say no yeah i mean rg i don't know in particular but like fatima saying i think media education is important uh, it also depends on what it is i think that you wish to do like do you wish to be a theorist do you wish wish to be a practitioner because um, for instance like the course that i was associated with for a very long time it's a purely documentary practice based course and actually to my knowledge is the only course in the country which focuses on documentary cinema uh, also because documentary cinema is like the stepchild of cinema per se and bollywood to khair bhuli ja 
but uh, so I feel like if this is what you want to like, if you're interested in being a practitioner of art or like a certain kind of cinematic language which attracts you, I think practice-based courses are a great idea. And for that, I would uh, when this course for sure, like if you put like the, the creative documentary course that I was a part of that, SRFTI, FTI, I think there's a particular uh, cinematic language uh, that these schools uh, cultivate, which is very useful uh, to uh, to somebody who's in, in, uh, interested in creative uh, uh, kind of a thing. Uh, for theory, I would actually, yeah, I mean, I think MCRC is great. Uh, it's one of the oldest and it also gives you a master's degree, which I think is so useful because if you wish to study further, uh, it's one because you know FTI and SRFTI also, if I'm not mistaken, they give you diplomas. They and, and so does CDC, uh, the Creative Documentary Course. They don't give you degrees, so it becomes very difficult if you wish to like pursue higher studies. It's very difficult to do that. Uh, I am the Indian Institute of Mass Communication in Delhi, and I'm sorry, my my responses are very Delhi based because that's what I know mostly. Uh, but there's also IIMC. I'm not sure whether they give a degree or a diploma. But uh, again, I think for a certain kind of a uh, uh, industry-based practice, I would assume, uh, that is something which is a good platform. And of course, now you also have these other, uh, other schools like Shrishti in Bangalore, uh, of which I've heard great things. Uh, they do some uh, lovely programs in design, in experimental cinema. So I feel like there, this is a choice that unfortunately is very difficult to make, but as you study more, you kind of understand. But I think for practice-based, there's a particular approach, and for theory, there's uh, you know, there's a certain way in which you go, and there are unfortunately right now there are very few institutes which I think offer a marriage of the two, which is the ultimate. Uh, but yeah, this is what I would. But I think yeah, definitely, I think education is great of any kind. Thanks, Ruchika. I think we have two time for two last questions. The first one I would direct to Isha, and the next to Neha. So um, Simran had asked, like you know, mostly women on camera always appreciate and give credit to their family, especially male members in the family. Don't you think it's a diplomatic answer? So I mean, is so what what is your take on that, Isha? This happens all the time. Uh, women tend to. Uh, I was uh, in February, right before the pandemic, I was shooting in uh, Afghanistan on the wheelchair basketball team. And the captain of this team is a firebrand who has achieved uh, great things. Uh, she's like an online feminist. She's captain of her team. She's running her house. And she was thanking her father and brother. Her brother for uh, dropping her to and fro and father for letting her do all of this. And while I understand the cultural context behind it, and they must have been great men to propel her forward, then it comes on to me as a filmmaker, whether that is the aspect of her that I wish to show or not. And while uh, there is a debate around how much editing and how much of a person's narrative you can change, but um, as uh, creators, uh, we sometimes do see these smaller biases that people have in them uh, and not just the thanking brothers and fathers things, simpler things like allowing me to work concept and uh, things like that. And as a creator, uh, you can see the truer self of a person in front of the camera uh, in a weird way. Like you can see what they are trying to mean and what is the true meaning of what they're saying and uh, edit it accordingly. So <laughs> I don't put these bites in, is what I do. Okay. okay. Uh, Isha and Neha, so uh, this question is from Tamasa. And uh, like, you know, in your position, you may instruct many, many, many male colleagues. Is it any different? To handle male, male colleagues than female colleagues. Yeah, so I think that's a very interesting question because I think uh, uh, when it comes to instructing male colleagues, I think I'm uh, assuming that you mean when men are working under me. So, uh, you know, I try myself, uh, you know, to be as considerate as possible, but I'm the same, uh, you know, to them as I am to my female colleagues. So I think that I think is, you know, what I've been trying to kind of, uh, you know, uh, a voice out since the beginning of this discussion that you know you leave your gender behind when you enter your workplace so it's not about uh, you know a female versus a male colleague a female boss versus a male uh, boss because i think a lot of these stereotypes like isha also said uh, or ruchika i'm uh, i'm sorry i don't know who said that but uh, you know most of these things are in our head you know how will this male uh, colleague of mine take my orders you know maybe he will go and uh, talk about me being uh, an egoistic uh, woman to his other uh, male colleagues you know these are all things in our head when you enter your workplace 
you are a you are a person you are a professional who's trying to do his or her best uh, you are someone who's trying to do the to do that within the confines of your value system and you are someone who's really stay, trying to stay true to your convictions there is no third thing that matters you know and and your gender is the least that matters that is something which we need to kind of really imbibe and internalize uh, for us to really move past this discussion of uh, you know male versus female uh, you know debate uh, you know in any industry oh thanks neha i think one last question i think we really really running out of time now so uh, snigda is asking again about crime journalism so it's about uh, it, it is not safe for uh, we one is told that it's not safe for girls so what are the essential thing safety tips for being a crime journalist that's a question basically isha maybe you can answer that i'm a very bad person to answer this because unlike neha i'm not wise and prudent and i do walk into situations and gladly so because uh, it's uh, just something that i do so i'm uh, how to be safe uh, is one um, demand uh, accountability from whichever organize let's say organization or production house or whatever news organization whichever way that you can demand accountability around your own safe safety you do that uh, be sure uh, you have to be prudent in the situations that you walk into uh, but do create support around you and uh, three do have certain level of fearlessness in you uh and uh, if you create in, in a safety net enough in, around you i feel like uh, you can take the chances because again sometimes uh, it's uh, our fears are in our head but again crime journalism itself uh, to break into that as a uh, female and not be relegated to uh, side stories it's important to uh, voice which part of crime journalism you are trying to get into if it's following deepika going for a drug case or if it's for something that you feel is um, more important to you whichever way it is uh, it is important for us to keep that in mind and always uh, ask for money get paid well so that you can take care of yourself thanks isha and thanks a lot ruchika isha and neha for joining you know and thank you thanks a lot and over to you surita thanks a lot for organizing this no thank you thanks everyone it was really nice yeah thank you and very nice of thanks yeah yeah all of thank you are busy professionals and you have taken time in such short notice and joined and i'm sure my students many of them asked questions Uh, and some it might have helped them to change their perspective to some extent thank you so much for taking time for us and thanks for a very interesting conversation thanks thanks a lot thank you so much thank you so much uh, audience for patiently listening and thank you suharita so thank you fatima thank you ruchika thank you. it was lovely interacting with all same here same here to officially end the plenary i'll now call up on my colleague ushushi rai san gupta Ushoshibi. Yes. Uh, good evening, all. Um, I'm uh, uh, Dr. Fatima, ma'am. Uh, I I I would take this opportunity just to thank you for raising such issues. Our uh, our students may not have been so you know outspoken, but this platform made them fearless. And uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for you know inciting them and inspiring them that yes, they can take to journalism very courageously and. Yes, the society is still not that bad. So, and yes, more power to women, ma'am. We celebrated womanhood through all the speakers uh, in this plenary session. And I would, you know, I would just add on to, uh, not add on to. I will just extract a few things from what uh, Ruchika, Neha, and Isha had said that uh, gender is a is a belief is a belief that we women consider for ourselves. So let us not think on gender, and let us be open. Because uh, as uh, Isha had said, that crime journalism was never a challenge for her. She had never met any bad uncles or not not any bad aunties. So and even when Ruchika and Neha rightly pointed out that uh, uh, yes, it it was the ceiling. The glass ceiling was all inside us. So it's time that we we make our inner 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 voices speak for us. And at the same time, ma'am, I again extend. our deepest gratitude uh, towards uh, you know towards all of you towards all of you for just you know 
helping our students be a more be more courageous more uh, fearless and uh, you know be allowing them to speak their minds out it was really inspiring for all of them thank you ma'am so now uh, we come to the concluding uh, parts segment of this webinar uh, for quite some time it is been running fantastically thanks to the digital media for making this happen means we are so safe here but at the same time it's such a challenge being safe here so i, I would just now uh, request uh, our honorable chair for the technical session uh, to you know to begin begin the technical session because uh, the presenters have been waiting and we are also eager to listen to them too so our chair uh, for the technical session is dr sweta singh so i introduce i choose to introduce her uh, and i i we are extremely we are extremely delighted to have her between us and since the beginning of the session she has been following it so uh, i i call upon uh, dr sweta singh and i introduce her to all our audience so dr sweta singh is uh, an assistant professor and course coordinator at the university school of mass communication guru gobind singh indraprastha university new delhi she has been a television journalist with doordarshan news new delhi and has also worked with the digital news ventures her phd thesis explores coverage of arab spring by news television in india she has presented her papers in international conferences organized by iamcr ica and amic in india and abroad she has published research papers and book chapters in the areas of journalism she recently contributed to the network of women and media in india report title panels or manuals desperately seeking women in indian she is con uh, currently contributing for the gmmp project a global study that monitors the representation of women in media her areas of interest include new media development journalism and international communication she has attended sessions on fake news by google news initiative and data leads she has been a recipient of international and national research grants she studied radio and television journalism at the indian institute of mass communication new delhi so ma'am with your permission uh, i i wish i request you uh, to inaugurate the technical session i will call upon the presenters only after you have your first few words uh, to co-chair the session is a faculty of the department uh, roshmi roy mukherjee so madam madam sweta singh i call upon you ma'am thank you dear sasi for that generous introduction and it is indeed my pleasure to be a part of this in media uh, webinar on the changing narratives and identities and i have been a part of it since the beginning of the session and i have been listening to some of these interesting perspectives coming uh, during the plenary and and the inaugural so so our session uh, so just a few words about uh, you know the housekeeping and i wanted to kind of uh, uh, initially inform uh, all the presenters about so uh, what we can, you know um, i've been told that uh, each paper can keep to 7 to 8 minutes 8 minutes at uh, as the upper limit for the presentation and uh, it will be followed by each paper will be followed by two or maximum three questions from uh, the google meet uh, chat section and maybe from the youtube um, or uh, you know options as possible and uh, i would request all of you to please keep strictly to the time and you will also be alerted 2 minutes ahead of your time um, by the co chair so uh, we are all set to begin i welcome yes, you all once again yes yes, yes madam yes ma'am uh, ma'am uh, before before we begin it formally so i would request the presenters to be ready uh, we will follow strictly the the uh, the the format that has been laid down in the in the brochure and we will follow the program schedule and uh, i'll request uh, my presenters to be very ready with their presentation uh, so that we do not waste much time and also request the audience for being so patient 
and also not to present themselves, not to unmute themselves, and not to keep their videos on when the presentation is going on. So, ma'am, our first presenter is uh, 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 the, the paper to be presented first is a case study on uh, spatial communication practices of Chettiar women from Devakottai. Uh, Levi Bruin, perspective by L. Ramalakshmi, research scholar, and Dr. Arul Selvan, uh, associate professor, Department of Electronic Media and Mass Communication, School of Media and Communication, Pondicherry University, India. So I would request the presenters to present. <laughs> Good evening to one and all present in this webinar today. I thank uh, Women's College Kolkata for this opportunity to present. Uh, I now uh, share my presentation. So uh, this is a case study I'm presenting about a particular family from Devakotai. Uh, this is a Lafa brain perspective. To keep up to the time, I'm going to quickly introduce the theoretical lights that I'm looking at. Uh, Henry Lafabre is a critical Marxist uh, who's discussed the production of space. He says that social space is a social product. And uh, he also states that uh, space embraces a multitude of intersections between the family and division of labor and its organization in the form of hierarchical social functions. So in this ancestral poem that you see here uh, in the presentation, the pink house, okay, something like this. This is a, uh, yes. I just wanted to add, is the presentation visible at, uh, at everyone's end? Because I am not able to see it. I've just shared my screen. Screen is not no, no. visible. Is everybody else able it's to not. screen no, is not visible. It's not visible. Now? No. No. Yeah, yes. Yes, yes. Now is okay. 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 Yeah. So uh in a Latabrian perspective, I'm gonna discuss how women have appropriated uh space in the ancestral Home. So to give a quick uh, preview of who these Chetiyas are, okay. So Chetiyas are an overseas uh, trading community, mercantile community from Tamil Nadu uh, in the Shivganga district. So they are known for uh, several aspects. So I don't want to call them as a community. I'm going to acknowledge them as a culture because they have a distinct dialect. They do speak Tamil, but in a distinct dialect. They have their own cuisine, their own kind of uh, jewelry, their... Uh, philanthropy, their business practices, and they were instrumental in uh, uh, developing the economy of Southeast Asia. Okay, so uh, uh, their fortune reflects in the palatial houses they built and lived and they always had to connect to their ancestral town. So uh, this is typically a layout of a Chetyar home. So there are four parts to it. The first zone is called the Mugapu or the outermost zone. The second zone is called the Valavu, the intermediate zone. The third zone is called the Rendam Kattu and the last is the Moondram Kattu or the third zone. Okay, Now this Rendam Kattu is called as the women only zone. Uh, the Valavu is where both the men and women could uh, use the space and Mugapu was exclusively for the men. Okay, So uh, typically the house that I I used to study is the green house, uh, the green color mansion that you see in this picture. And the objective of the study is to explore the spatial and communication practices of Chetyar women of a particular family in uh, Devakote. This Devakote is supposed to be uh, one of the most conservative towns amongst the 96 villages of uh, Chetina belt. And uh, this family that I'm concentrating on is the OMSPL lineage, the foremost family like uh, I won't say zamindars, but something, uh, you know, they were, they were one of the prime families out of the five top families of uh, Devakote, OMSPL family is the foremost, okay. So, um, I used autoethnography, participant observation and in-depth interview with nine women from the different generations of the family. I used purpose of sampling because uh, this is a close-knit uh, family and for people to share their personal narrative, personal experience is going to be difficult. They need, they need to trust me to share their personal experiences okay so this uh, table gives you uh, a brief idea about the uh, demographics of my respondents so all my respondents are either married uh, and uh, two of them are remarried all of them are, have had basic education and they're from three different generations so there's a college dropout there's someone who's just done class seven who's a senior most of about 77 years old and they all have an affiliation to Devakote. okay so they they have different domestic roles. Their daughter of the family, mother-in-law, 
daughter in law daughter okay so different domestic roles so basically uh, the culture wise i want to say that uh, this house design uh, had a segregated space and then masculine hegemony was quite common even when i grew up you know it was very common for uh, women in the family to say uh, that the men are there don't go there uh, don't do this you're not a boy uh, you know the, the boys were given the privilege and interaction between uh, uh, you know um, people in the family that that is with the opposite sex was supposed to be minimal especially once we came of age and there was special restriction if men were in certain part of the house especially the mugappu we were not supposed to go there and women could not enter through the um, through the main door there was a secondary door for the women to conveniently use so okay, they say that it was for their uh, convenience but then you know they usually don't enter the side where the men are seated okay and uh, domestic roles and marital status also dictated how women used the space in the ancestral home and uh, also language okay so how they speak okay who they speak to what, what the interaction is like all this uh, matter and, and over a period of time this language has also changed for example in a wedding when they give out uh, there is a certain kind of poetry that they write in place of the couple or any function for that matter like a shit kid birthday anniversary in the language is changed now okay so there is change though i say that this is the cultural aspect okay so the practice has changed over a period of time clothing so in the ancestral home there was a certain kind of clothes that you have to wear you have to wear traditional clothes especially once you come of age you cannot wear uh, you know anything that they wouldn't accept food dining so the men always dine so this is the cultural aspect men dine first followed by the women so these are culturally acknowledged practices that changed over a period of time okay now like i mentioned there was a side entrance through which the women have to uh, move about there were certain rituals that can be carried out only by the men and then uh, there was a routine that said that this is what the men do this is what the women do traveling abroad was restricted up to the 1970s and uh, you know only the men could go and uh, then um, uh, menstruation was uh, a very big thing you know, women were uh, confined to certain uh, spaces like the forbidden spaces you know they they were not permitted into those spaces especially when they were menstruating and uh, the in, uh, the respondents did express that their spirit was dampened especially during this time as if they were uh, they were untouchable and all that okay and uh, vera vital is uh, the concept of declaring a married couple as a conjugal unit okay so uh, this this concept gave greater autonomy to the family unit okay and when did this actually improve okay, this condition okay? uh, and and of course women did not have access to the public sphere especially once they came of age this is all what i'm talking about even up to the 1990s okay so now uh, act migration and okay so the the chetiar community uh, i mean the chetiars they had to move out of uh, uh, the villages okay move on to the cities and all that for the sake of uh, employment and uh, uh, education so during this uh, time you know uh, they could socialize with other people they exposed other culture they were educated they sought employment okay this this condition their mindset and their gender perception was uh, 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 oh my lord da sheta ma'am one minute left all right so uh, now once the, these uh, 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 what happened when we go back to our ancestral town okay visits became minimal because we are preoccupied with our employment and education okay so now i'm going to quickly talk about these uh, few incidents okay uh, about how we appropriated negotiated and appropriated a space the space in the ancestral town okay so first uh, when i made a documentary film in my village okay my servant a male servant was shocked that i was alone with a tripod in the middle of the road okay so he felt that the boss's granddaughter cannot be there okay and that was seen in a critical light on the other hand uh, the daughter in law of the family was driving an suv alongside a father in law which is quite unlikely in the village okay and uh, respecting the sanctity of the home during menstruation is still common okay and lena seven is an event which uh, bro help to break down the fellowship and friendship okay so uh, now how far have we come is that usually women don't go to the crematorium or participate in the lord rites but this has also been broken down now from a personal experience recently when my grandfather passed away about a fortnight ago i was the one who had to take the lead and uh, you know take care of him because he was uh, not feeling well and given what i explained with these uh, photographs so now if you see in these photographs in the living hall of the uh, um uh, of, of of the house you see only the men who occupied the space 
okay but now how it is changed is that women don't use the second entry if you see in the greenhouse on the left hand side there's a second door okay which looks less ornate compared to the main door near the uh, bush that you see there okay so now these women started using the front door and there's some pictures that give you an idea of how women use the ancestral space earlier they were, they did not come to the uh, intermediate space uh, comfortably but now they are uh, they, they, it's common for them and even their attire you know wearing frocks or salwar or churidar is acceptable uh, sun preference is still uh, you know celebrated this is typically the uh, court here the central uh, court here rama lakshmi uh, if you can just yeah. wind up because we are uh, we have crossed the limit yeah all right so uh, now uh, the the what what i would like to conclude is that uh, time is so over sheta ma'am yeah yeah so uh, the interaction between the three spaces constitute to the social space and so does the change in the social space constitute to the changes in the perceived space conceived space and the lived space and with that i am thank you for the opportunity thank you rama lakshmi um i would like to invite questions uh, if there be any in the chat box um in the meantime i have uh, a very uh, basic question uh, in the presentation you had mentioned about deva kotai being the conservative Uh, uh you know uh, of of all the um, you know sample spaces yeah that you had taken up so why do you term it as uh, most conservative and the second question is like uh, you bring some ethnographic understanding to the research right yeah. so how did you go about selecting these nine women if you will okay. uh now uh, the first uh, answering your first question uh devakote is said to be the most conservative because in the chetinad bell there are just reflect on that yeah there are, there are 96 uh, ma'am i'm sorry the, your voice broke just to clarify you had two questions one is about devakote another about how i sample the respondents right 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 great thank you for the question so first uh, devakote is said to be the most conservative because there are 96 uh towns in the chetinad belt collectively okay they called chetinad devakote is said to be conservative because they were more rigid in their cultural practices they were one of the last ones to open up for example uh even uh, you know getting a daughter married they would not give the daughter outside the village okay so they were very conservative they are uh, you know even education wise okay the other villages villages had opened up much more okay uh but they these people are more spiritual most close knit and you know they kept it to themselves so that that's why they were quote said to be quite conservative and those days i'm talking about 40 50 years ago people used to fear getting their daughters married into a devakote family because of the rigid practices so this is documented also in a thesis uh, from jawaharlal nehru university by one scholar called shri devi okay so this is one the second aspect how did i sample the uh, respondents okay so uh now uh, in this family that i chose one of the top 5 families this family was accessible because i belong to that family I, i have an affiliation towards the family one sampling the family per se because they one of the top 5 families and second is these women were sampled based on their special experiences that they were open to divulge the trust that they had on me it's not about two friends getting along and chatting but they were willing to contribute uh, uh, to uh, to the study per se and mm-hmm. over a period of time we have discussed how we've been breaking down the gender perception i could not explain one particular slide due to want of time but uh, the slide on fellowship and kinship how it was promoted okay to make the women feel better they have to accept themselves more than the men putting down the women it's about the women wanting to accept themselves and do something so the women who were open to this thought were the ones who were part of the study okay um there is one question i think uh, from uh, sudita uh, she wants to ask uh, what is your take as in how has the concept of gendered space how is it changing in the cyber space um okay it may not um, be related to your research but if you have a take on that i can still uh, answer this question with rela- in relation to my research okay. uh the one of the discussions that we had in the panel was about how uh, technology is gendered 
mm-hmm. uh, you know especially in this pandemic time when there's only one smartphone and who gets access to it right so in my study there is one aspect about women's access to technology okay and how it was gendered okay now uh, this gendered uh, 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 participation was broken down after this particular um, uh, event of promoting fellowship and kinship in the family was brought about and we completed about 10 10 years of this celebration okay it's a annual event where the men and women come together they participate it's totally beyond the family norms or anything okay? it's just to just a day for ourselves just to reunite and you know um, know who's who how we are related and all those things okay so this concept of gender space per se is broken down it's no more like you know only the husbands can have the folks so have morning family women the time and women in the family are too busy you know breakfast time making time you know the kitchen okay. time and all that but they are prompt on time to answer a question and sometimes they do it from their husband's phone also for a second chance so i think pretty much it's about uh, it oh, is broken sorry yeah. sita ma'am the 2 minutes right. is over thank you okay yeah 2 minutes um shall we go on to the next presentation now y- yes, yes ma'am, ma'am. Yes. so do so, we have this paper on hypermasculinity hyper- yeah, and yes, yes. sexual appeal in advertising Yes, ma'am. Should I call call the presenter? So, what's the unified Amrita? Amrita, I can yes, see Amrita yes. is there. Okay. Amrita, please share your presentation. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, and thank you, Women's College Kolkata, for the opportunity. I will present the screen now. And please keep to six, seven minutes so that we have enough time for yes. question and answers. Sure, ma'am. is it visible screen yeah yeah it's yes coming. yes coming yes so time it starts now okay yeah sure hello everyone i am amrita balakrishnan presenting the paper titled hypermasculinity and sexual appeal in advertisements towards unified theory the study was carried out under the guidance of dr francis p barclay In the study a section of advertisements is content analyzed and coded for hypermasculinity hyperfemininity gender neutrality anti stereotypes body exposure sexual appeal and ideal body image using the grounded theory approach focus group discussions were conducted to critically analyze how the audience view the portrayal of these concepts in advertisements and to build a unified theory premise ads a highly pervasive and cast a tremendously consequential impact on the masses ads sometimes reinforce predominant perceptions hence it also doubles as a research tool to study the existing belief systems mass media are believed to be a pervasive force in shaping physical appearance ideals and have been shown to negatively impact body image people exposed to ideal body images image ads became significantly more depressed and had higher levels of dissatisfaction than those exposed to neutral ads hypermasculinity may be a risk factor for perpetrating violence against women and that these men may have a lower aggression threshold in ads females are shown as highly sexualized and highly attractive and inconsistent with male fantasies now let's look into what is hypermasculinity it is an exaggerated belief about manliness and male identity toughness as emotional self control violence as, as manly danger as exciting and careless attitudes towards women and sex are some of the misconceptions related to this concept concept Hyperfemininity is an exaggerated adherence to a stereotypical feminine gender role. What is ideal body image? Oxford English Dictionary defines it as a person's mental picture of how good or bad their physical appearance is. Need and background of the study. 
Advertising is believed to play a role in constructing hypermasculinity. Ads of men's products like deodorant and alcohol, to name a few, try to entice its prospective consumers by glorifying hypermasculinity. Body image dissatisfaction has been associated with harmful effect on the psychological well-being. The social cultural perspective on body image assigns central importance to media exposure as potent exposing means of unrealistic images of the female beauty ideals. Research suggests that being skeptical of media messages is associated with positive body image and can act as a buffer against negative body image outcomes. Manipulations such as watching media messages representing the ideal body, the presence of a group, the gender makeup of the group, and body exposure, among other manipulations, can aggravate body image concerns. Objectives of the study to content analyze ads using semiotics and to identify hypermasculinity, hyperfeminity, body image, body exposure, and sexual appeal. To conduct a qualitative study to understand the perception of audience about hypermasculinity, hyperfeminity, body image, body exposure, and sexual appeal in ads. Research methods employed in the study. A section of ads have been content analyzed and coded for hypermasculinity, hyperfeminity, gender stereotyping, anti-stereotypes, body exposure, sexual appeal, and ideal body image. Qualitative focus group discussions using the grounded theory approach are also used to bridge theoretical gaps. Major findings of the study. Masculinity depicted in ads are mostly exaggerated and misleading. Portrayal of women in ads are often biased and reinforces the existing gender stereotype. Ads that supposedly break existing gender stereotype create new stereotypes. Ads containing body exposure are frowned upon unless the advertised product is demanded and that it is necessary to grab attention. Many ads that seem to be gender neutral are not so. There are subtle gender biases and prejudices present in them. Ads that project ideal body image are condemned and there is an apprehension over the consequences like body dissatisfaction, anxiety, and low self-esteem. Sexual appeal is mostly unrelated to the product advertised and conceals the utility of the product or service or idea advertised. This is the unified theory we have come up from the qualitative analysis. In this, you can see that though there are both, um, both favorable and unfavorable opinion regarding violence, it is considered to be necessary to attract the youth. However, showing women as timid or weak is not favored. Anti-stereotype ads can challenge stereotypes but may covertly create new stereotypes. Many gender neutral ads carry subtle gender biases in them. Body exposure is considered unacceptable because of the unrealistic representation, yet favored if the product demands it. Ideal body image and sexual appeal are equally condemned. With that, we have come to the end of the study. Thank you. These are the references. Thank you, Amrita. So, if there be any questions for the presenter, so as we wait for the questions, Amrita, would you like to share? Um, you have uh, used both content analysis as well as quantitative grounded theory approach for focus group discussions. So, uh, when you went, did your content analysis, did you have any specific matrix or a template in mind? to conduct your and uh, do your content analysis ma'am uh, while uh, doing and how did you go about review, it while uh, doing the review of literature uh, on mm -hmm. hypermasculinity all these uh, seven concepts i identified certain mm -hmm. traits uh, which was which which was 
put forth by the researchers like uh, violence is associated with hyper masculinity aggression mm. uh, callous mm. attitude towards women emotional uh, like um being very tough emotionless mm. these traits are associated with hyper masculinity and hyper femininity so you didn't have a tough. fixed uh, fixed kind of a uh, you didn't have a fixed category or sets of categories or sub categories you you just went by certain uh, general understanding of uh, hyper masculinity based right? on a review of literature based on previous studies reviews of literature okay all right so there is one more question for you um, this is uh, it says this is by tamasa ghosh she says um, you mention about anti stereotypes in advertising how does that help the brand in the long run it creates a very good image among the public because uh oh, there was like i don't know many many of you might be familiar uh, there were many sexist ad series by uh, the famous van wissen famous clothing brand so um they were like i don't have anything to show now like it was very sexist in nature like showing men overpowering women but later on they came up with another series of ads with the same set same uh, same portrayal same reversal of such ads so as to create an anti stereotype so it So, it shows that uh, yeah. they are willing to undo what they have done what wrong things they have done so that is a very welcome change all right and uh, during when conducting the focus group discussion many participants said that though such ads might inspire women to fight patriarchy however there were other participants who uh, who opined that such ads are creating certain new stereotypes so only critical people can uh, can understand the subtle subtle stereotypes present in such ads however pe people mm -hmm. audience who are very passive they think that it is it, it is a very welcome change that it it creates a new wave of feminism Shweta ma'am, time is so, over now. So, okay, yeah, then it is over. The, yeah, thank you, Amta, and we move thank to the you. next presenter. Shall we move to the third yeah. paper, which is moving away from binaries? Do we have the presenter? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, let me introduce the presenter. Okay, moving yes, away Christy. from binaries. Yes, Christy. Yes, Christy. understanding the emergence of youtube as a safe space for reconstructing gender identities by christy sebastian pg student and vasubhadra sri krishnan assistant professor department of communication madras christian college Ma'am, is my uh, PPT visible? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. No. Okay. No problem. Your time is starts now. Okay. Okay, ma'am. My to uh, my name is Christy Sebastian. I'm pursuing my masters in communication from Madras Christian College, and my topic is moving away from binaries, understanding the emergence of YouTube as a safe safe space for reconstructing gender identities. So today. i'm here to walk you through how youtube emerged as a safe space for reconstructing gendered identities now if you look at it many people who fall within the spectrum of youtube have always turned to uh within the spectrum of lgbtq i have always turned to youtube for motivation especially for gender dialogues and also for expressing their lived experiences 
Now, as you can see in this uh, image here, you can see the uh, the need for them to be re uh, understand or be seen in the YouTube. So the highlight of the work is the vocabularies identified within the context of coming out videos, which help with the deeper understanding. And that is what I have shown in the image. Now, the foundation of this work is centered around the words such as gender identity, sexuality, sexual orientation, coming out videos, LGBTQI, YouTube and caste model of identity formation. Now, the theoretical framework that I've derived to analyze this topic are from queer theory and caste model of identity formation. Now, I've also pulled strands from the Judith Butler's concept of heteronormativity, heterosexual matrix, and Edward Said's concept of the other. Now, these concepts have helped me to understand the positioning of the subject in a contemporary world that is in straight world. Literature has actually helped me to strengthen my uh, uh, analysis and my topic. So if you look at it, new media in the coming out has uh, coming out in the process of coming out has helped the LGBTQ in a very vast extent because Internet is an inevitable part of their lives. It has also helped them to explore their identity. New media served as a red carpet of information promoting gender fluidity and also as a support system for the people who are in conflict with themselves and uh, helping them to find a way in navigating in the contemporary world. Dr. Kass presented a six-stage model based upon individuals' perception of their own behaviors and actions within the Western culture's viewpoint. So according to this um, uh, Kass model, we uh, gave an idea how identity is achieved through a developmental process and interaction between individuals and the environment. Now, there is an inherent perception to prioritize male and female in every society. And by default, we assume every person or every man, or every individual to be a cisgender heterosexual. Now, the theme or the base of queer theory is to critique these notions of femininity and masculinity and um, and to deconstruct the notions of normalcy surrounding around them. Uh, now, the objectives of, of this research is the uh, we have uh, uh, taken three major objectives that are gender narratives, gender dialogues and gender vocabulary. And to further understand, I've adopted the methodology of content analysis and narrative analysis. And the research design com uh, comprises of a combination of a qualitative latent content analysis and directed content analysis. And uh, narrative analysis and misanse has also been used in this uh, research paper. And the videos taken for analysis are, I'm coming out by Nikki Tutorials. Uh, twins come out to dad by Aaron Roth, and I'm coming out as gay by Ali Roos. Now, the key words that I, I identified while analyzing all these videos are accept, yourself, share, and references. And why the reason for coming out are call to normalize, turmoil in identity, that is struggle and liberation, attention in popular culture. Okay, my findings on these videos are there is a pertinent urge to be accepted by the people. That, that is, the LGBTQ, LGBTQ people are, have this urge in them to be accepted by the people as well as by the society. And uh, decide identities attained through different stages as postulated by caste and by gender dialogues. Uh, they used YouTube to call out and inspire people to come out. Now, not just their own experiences, but vloggers who, who have come out through YouTube serve as a source of motivation for the people who are actually finding it difficult to come out. Now, negotiating their identity through YouTube by explaining their lived experiences. Once they have exp uh, explained about their lived experiences, it is it's actually easy for the people who are actually struggling with uh, 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 the orientation or gender identity crisis. Now, another key uh, uh, study that I found is how they reflect on the heteronormativity and the judgment surrounding the queer community. Now, the interesting highlights of this paper is the set of vocabularies. That is the vocabularies that are identified within the context of coming out videos. 
and the vloggers negotiate and navigate their lives in a straight world so the dialogues and the words they have used in the videos are actually strategy for self representation now before all uh, everything else about it's the acceptance of self acceptance is the most emphasized concept and uh, before seeking an external uh, validation now the uh, overall conclusion of this uh, paper is the work is done within a qualitative research design embedded in content analysis and narrative analysis now when i started doing this research my primary aim was to educate people like me who are not in within the spectrum of lgbtqi to at least have a idea of their struggles like us this is a small effort from my side to the people like me who are who are not able to understand their struggles so that is the reason why i started with this research paper now an integration or uh, integration of how individuals resorted to youtube as a medium for information consumes stories of coming out experience through a gen through gender dialogues thereby forging their identity the narrative is mainly consisted of the troubles they had gone through acceptance from the family and finally the triumph they had embarked on the journey uh, the vocabulary is identified acted as a strategy for people struggling to coming out such deliberations paved way for negotiating their identity and were achieved by breaking away from heteronormativity by accepting themselves first as i mentioned all the words i mean the vocabulary is identified yes, in the one minute left okay ma'am uh, like i mentioned earlier the vocabulary is identified within this context of coming out it is primarily served as a way or a strategy to negotiate themselves or navigate their, their lives in a straight world these are the references uh, and uh, thank you thank you christy that was a very interesting presentation and uh, thank, uh, thank i have you. a question but then before that uh, i see surita is uh, posing a question here uh, you can also read it at your end in the chat box i'll just uh, read that aloud for you it says uh, um, is online uh, space helping people to identify themselves more, more freely uh or is it offering just another mask in the layers of masks of identity i think actually so is that in a way help people articulate themselves yeah go ahead i think actually online spaces are helping people but if, if you look at ellen degeneres coming out on a sitcom ellen actually she is a she is a uh, person who has influenced any other celebrities lgbtq celebrities uh, from the west and because of her many people have come out so i think online spaces actually helping them to come out then i don't think they are masking it if they want to mask it they don't really have to come online if they want to mask it i guess but the online spaces definitely no, uh, i think uh, christy uh, uh, what surita is trying to ask here is that yes online space people are getting this opportunity to kind of express themselves articulate themselves identify themselves and things like that but it, does it really help the structural inequality that exists does it really make a difference or is it that one gets a a feeling that yes it works but it actually does not make much of a difference at the end of the day i think it does make a sense i mean help them at the end of the day that's of all the video we have analyzed that's what they have actually uh, explained about it uh, it's actually they negotiating through that uh, online space mm -hmm. and then we have one more question from tamasa she is asking how do you think the gender identity crisis is accepted Just in a conservative country, because it's not from India. So, can you just share your understanding on this? A gender crisis. Okay, in India, I think we have a long way to go. But the recent uh, decriminalization, Section three seventy seven, has taken down. I think we have managed to move a little bit forward. But again, we have long way to go in a conservative country. But the thing with us, India was a liberal uh, country before the colonization. We actually celebrated gender fluidity. So it's after the colonization, the homophobia, everything related to that had happened. So I think we can, we will move forward. Uh, in, in this context, yeah, in time. Thank you, Christy, for the interesting presentation. So uh, the next one, I think, 
is communicating trust during pandemic the fourth presentation Rashmi? yes, yes ma'am so can we have the presenter uh, <coughs> yes ma'am we, we are here we are here ma'am we both are uh, doing the presentation may I order uh, this is shibinam then i'm one of the co-authors of the paper uh let's press him so yes, we have mohana mohana is there and uh we both are doing the presentation ma'am shibi right. and amala okay shibi welcome please go ahead uh is my presentation visible yes. so, no no uh, no no my presentation is Yes, loading now. Yes. Yeah. The title of yes. the uh, first yes, of all, uh, yes. hello everyone. So yes, thanks for giving us this opportunity. Yes. What a new research study. So yes. Beginning with you the You have six minutes. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yes. Communicating trust during pandemic. Asha workers and Kerala model. So before going into the presentation, I would like to inform you all. Yes. So I would like to inform everyone that uh, the current is still uh, the studies currently under progress, and we are right now with the data collection phase. So uh, with that, I go ahead. So the COVID pandemic has reiterated the importance of effective health communication. Containing pandemic spread demands a change in behavior of people on a large scale. Thus, communication about best practices and preventive measures to people and to actualize compliance becomes necessary. Early studies have shown that uh, trust upon the communicator and the health provider has a positive effect on compliance. With this understanding, we approach the works done by accredited social health activists in Kerala, also known as ASHA workers. Kerala is an Indian state which has been lauded by the World Health Organization for its work in tracking and containing the COVID-19 spread between the state's public health officials and the people uh, under the local administrative bloc. Uh, I communication see this with the people is interpersonal, slide. which has been widely recommended. Uh, the method of interpersonal communication um, has been widely recommended. Can you hear us? We can't see yes, your slides. I, I'm just giving moving. an introduction. I'll, I'll move ahead with the slides. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. I can hear you. Can, uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes, I'm just giving a small introduction. I'll move ahead with the slides in a moment. Fair enough. Please go ahead. So, uh, their communication with the people uh, is interpersonal, which has been widely recommended in health and behavioral change interventions. So uh, with this, we went ahead with the uh, following objectives. So the objectives of the study are to explore communication strategies and measures adopted by ASHRA for effective communication during the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact, and to explore the role of women as health communicators and how they are constructing trust among public, and also to identify the critical aspects which are to be considered by communicators regarding the socio-political environment in which the health emergency communication takes place. So the literature that we, uh, we have reviewed and referred to are as follows. So the major, there are two major scopes of the study and the uh, connection, the linkages between the scope and the literature concerning gender difference in any kind of crisis or risk management are first is mobilization of other women in taking preparedness action. The influence of women can contribute to the adoption of protective measures and hazard adjustments. The participation of women in social networks marks as a key factor in disseminating vital information. The other scope is that involving women in decision making processes through women's organization. Women have the most effective communication skills because of their tendency towards uh, shared communication and active listening. And when it comes to uh, interpersonal communication, prior studies have also shown 
interpersonal communication with other communication types has been widely recommended in health and behavioral change interventions due to its significant impact on behavioral uh, intentions cognitive orientations and perceptions of the personal risk so based on the studies explaining the potential role of women in delivering health risk and uh, crisis information to communities through interpersonal communication and how it constructs trust the following hypothesis and the research uh, question have been postulated for the current research hypothesis one is women as health communicators have an effect on development of public trust and confidence women as health communicators have an effect on improvement of health services and the research question is how interpersonal communication has played a role in effective management of the pandemic so the methodology which we have used to our, uh, for the study are for sampling uh, and for the hypothesis uh, research participants will be the people who came back to kerala from other states of india and overseas in the late may june and july will be randomly selected from the lists provided by local healthcare workers from 14 districts of, uh, of the state and from those who have registered under the non resident care lights affairs or norca structured telephonic interview will be conducted among 14 asha workers representing 14 districts of kerala data collection and will include 25 items cities as uh, 16 item patient satisfaction scale is used to measure the characteristics of healthcare workers and that of the service received by the respondents five dimensions of trust as identified by staten and et al will be used to measure uh, the overall public trust of the respondents on healthcare system the the questioner will also address the communicative experience confidence level cooperative attitude development of the respondents survey will be present the survey result will be presented through descriptive and and if necessary through inferen inferential statistical analysis and my uh, co-author amala will go ahead with the discussion part thank you shibhi so so far we have conducted in depth interviews with 10 asha workers representing 10 districts in kerala the duration of the in depth interviews around 1 to 2 hours and for beginning we have started from uh, calicut district and for sindhu a 42 year old 48 year old asha worker she used to collect the data uh, basically related to covid prevention activities and she has collected and updated the details of all residents in her ward she has to ensure that uh, the ho home quarantine facilities are up to prescribed standards and also see to it that families and persons advised home quarantine stay at home and maintain social distance and another asha worker from trishu district uh, we have contacted srikala so she is saying that since we interact with the other families regularly they get to know us well and they inform us when people from other district states or foreign countries come also when we visit houses people are always eager to know more about the prevention methods and new updates related to covid 19 also another asha worker from kollam district rajini she discuss about the things which they are con uh, talking with the shweta ma'am 7 minutes over contacting okay, with the last people. minute amala yes yes ma'am contacting with the people so they are saying that uh, they used to talk with these people who are in quarantine and she will provide information related to pandemic and cancel their problems always try to comfort the distress in distress in people and their conversation topics are <coughs> diverse ranging from queries related to virus best prevention practices mental health checkups diet plans and public health care initiatives so similar way in ambujakshi another asha worker from alapura district added that villagers stress them and they say asha sister is here so there is no there won't be any problem during this pandemic so one of the problem most of the asha workers highlighted that the quality of an asha is that one needs to talk to the people of village regularly so comprising the data which we have gathered so far health workers thus emphasize the values of cooperation continuous and open communication personal and professional motivation and empathy as a critical element of trust and these elements are important to build a trust based health system so we are looking forward to the remaining in depth interviews with the asha workers and survey data which will be collected from people who have completed their quarantine 
to get to know more about their feedback related to the service provided by the ASHA workers. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think it was in a Russian hurry. No, that's fine. It was well yeah, presented. So thank you, you Shibi and Amala and Ms. Urita as well as, as for the presentation. And if there be questions, we welcome the questions in the chat box or on the YouTube platform. If there be any. In the Google Meet, so, there is a no question, but. In the Google, OK. I think uh, uh, the paper was uh, really interesting and it really highlights uh, the importance of interpersonal communication, which is often neglected when we talk of uh, the role of media uh, in health communication. So uh, this uh, paper is extremely valuable in that sense. So uh, yeah, I mean, since it's a working paper, uh, we look forward to your uh, complete work in future. Yes, and uh, it's just that you know some of these scales that you have mentioned uh, where you have said that you have, you'll be using some patient scale uh, either you or us uh, shibi or amala can take that can you repeat the question ma'am you had mentioned somewhere in, in your study that you're uh, following this so it is all 16 item patient satisfaction scale, right? Yes, ma'am. So what is that? Can you elaborate on that? So we have used it for preparing the questionnaire, ma'am. So inside the patient uh, satisfaction scale, we have included their uh, major features provided by the ASHA workers, how they have treated the quarantine patients. And uh, they, we have uh, mentioned, we have, an, we are going to analyze it on the basis of the satisfaction they have received, like how many times they have contacted, will they, did they well behaved, did their opinion count, and uh, were they treated very well, and did the calls make them uh, satisfied or give any personal uh, comfort, and did they enable, uh, help them to confront their distress like that? Most of the mm -hmm. cases we are analyzing the stat satisfaction. And another trust factor, which we are also included there, which enable us to analyze uh, the trust factors, which has developed uh, during this conversation with ASHA worker. Because all the quarantine people uh, will get a call, regular call from ASHA worker once they started their quarantine period, even if they started from one first day or even if they, it, till they complete the quarantine period. It can uh, lead to 21 or 28 days, but till then they will receive a call, regular call from an ASHA worker. So they will be checking upon them. All right. So I think we can now move to the next paper. Next. So we have this fifth paper on changing representation of tribal women in Malayalam cinema. This sounds very interesting by Gayatri Baiju, um, Department of Journalism and Mass Communication, Calicut. Hello. Do we have Gayatri? Yeah, Gayatri, please begin your presentation. Yes, ma'am. Can you can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, I'm Gayatri Baiju from the Department of JMC, University of Calicut. Today in the session, I'll be presenting my paper entitled "Changing Representation of Tribal Women in Malayalam Cinema." Your time starts. Film being a mode of representation constantly involved in building images, defining and redefining the social sphere along with life in it. Marginalized groups are the most underrepresented and women are the most misrepresented in the Malayalam cinema industry. The case is deplorable when it is a combination of both. The general objective of my study is to analyze the change in the representation of tribal female characters in Malayalam cinema. The study adopted qualitative content analysis of selected 15 Malayalam films, three from each 10 years. The female characters were analyzed using the following criteria, screen presence, physical appearances, social status, character identity, justice to reality. Till 1970s. Some early films like Vanamala, Anavati Penkuti, Kartamaina and Kartamaliga had the jungle as a backdrop. Earlier tribal female characters were constantly used in these three common situations. Background dancers for songs and love making sequences. Rescuing the main characters stranded in woods with magical, tribal, powerful medicines, cheated by the civilized man from village or city. 1970 to 79. The first film with an importance to tribal life was Nella by Ramu Karyat. It was an adaptation of the novel with the same title written by P. Varsala. 
the film deals with the unique customs manners beliefs taboos and prejudices of the adyar community jay bharathi as mara a young girl in love with a with kanaga durga as kuru mati a sexually frustrated middle aged woman where the two prominent female characters in the movie it is striking to note that the first notable tribal film in malayalam narrates the story of an outsider perspective Picnic, another visually rich film directed by J. Shashi Kumar, which tells the story of a devastated tribal settlement which was evicted due to the construction of the dam. Lakshmi starred the role Mala, the lady loves the main actor. The film Pony was based on the lifestyle of Adivasis of Attapadi. The film shows the tribal slash and burn cultivation methods and the government's interventions. Lakshmi handled the lead role and was portrayed as a tribal beauty with splashy costumes with naked shoulders, colorful bangles and necklaces. All tribal female characters in the film during this period have some common patterns with main role with names acted by prominent actresses of the industry white glamorized actresses environmental and social issues being addressed jungle type semi new new dressing animal accessories and exaggerated decorations vulnerable lovable and frustrated young ladies 1980 to 1989 there was a progress from changing the tribal role from white to brown actresses making the portrayal a bit more realistic malamugale devam is a movie directed by pn menon the film was set in a tribal village in kerala where religious superstitions existed arjuna played the role of mari who was later being sexually assaulted by the landlord character uyiram nan nadage is 1985 film directed by p chandramar based on the book kerala tele africa surya played the role jagamma which was the lady love of the actor chitram was a film who began to pictureize tribals in a comical manner Many female characters were depicted in the film and served as tools for visual pleasure without names and identities. All the tribal characters in these films followed a pattern like sub roles with names acted by less important actresses of the industry, brown or uh, uh, actresses in natural makeover, less social importance in themes, animal accessories and exaggerated decorations, visually pleasure and intellectually low female. 1990 to 1999. This period must be considered as the darkest era while addressing the primal fear and representation in Malayalam cinema. Most films in this era that depicted tribal lives were semi-porn movies. Representational patterns circles around a certain set of images such as a bloodthirsty savage, illiterate and uncultured clumsy female etc. The song and dance sequences come from a pattern of exotic and sexualized pleasure object and eventually formulating a fetish objectification. All the tribal female characters in the film during this period have common patterns main roles with names acted by unrecognized actors of industry brown complexioned actors in natural makeover adult content vulnerable victimized and sexually frustrated 2000-2009 the millennium movies came back with lead roles as tribal women the film carta jambagam directed by vijayan revolves around the life of tribal group who were living isolated in a forest area the title roles were was handled by charmi kaur the film ends up in a rape attempt against the villain against and the villain was later killed by the female protagonist bamboo boys is a 2002 film showing four tribal men who went to the outside world to impress the lady love interest who shares such a, uh, just a few scenes in the movie aparijitan is a 2004 malayalam horror movie directed by sanjeev shivan and the film depicts kalyani portrayed by the young actress mahi as a smart intelligent enthusiastic and young tribal girl she was raped and killed by a gang of people and she later Riven took revenge uh, by ghost spirit. All the tribal female characters during this period shared some common notions like main roles with names acted by upcoming new film industry and white glamorized actresses uh, victimized major majority being raped and uh, the tribal women took revenge revenge against the villains. 2010 to 2019. These ten years can be labeled as the golden. years of tribal female depiction in the history of malayalam cinema kenjira yoginda pustakam nyan kandan portrayed strong female roles with names and natural visual depiction papio buddha of 2013 is an indian feature film written and directed by jayan k cherry and focuses on the atrocities committed against tribals women and the environment the film casted nine 150 adivasis politically active tribal women was the contribution of this movie the role of sarida was handled by manjushri and was one of the finest and strongest female roles in the year udalaram is a 2018 film by unikrishna navala the film is incredibly special as the lead roles were played by tribal actors ramya valsla and mani 
The film is a real life story of the tribal transgender and spouse. The Big Blockbuster of 2019, IFN Coaching, was directed by Sachi and it changed the perspective of looking on a tribal woman. The lead female role, Karnama, was handled by Gauri Nanda, the highly political lady character, and was picturized as sharp, strong, repulsive. The mass applause must be observed as the acceptance of tribal women role among the mainstream, along with a tinge of extreme politics and revolutionary ideologies. The major contributions of these 10 years are change from white complexions actors to relatively dark complexions real life time actors, lead roles with political, strong political stand, real life characters inspired and adapted, natural costumes, real time tribal actors introduced, international acclaim. To conclude, the portrayal of tribal women characters changed a lot during the 50 years. The change was slow but steady. The change was slow but steady till 2010. It was extremely high in the recent 10 years that showed drastic change in the characterization, importance, and reality oriented scripting. Many real life characters were adapted. Politically and socially active female roles were picturized. A major turning point was the presence of tribal women in the filmmaking process as well. Ramya Valsala is a tribal woman who acted in many movies. Very recently, the old female singer Nanjiyama from Attapadi Tribal Settlement sang the hit charter of 2019 in her own ethnic singing style. Tribal woman director Leela Santos started filming her debut film after many short films. This gives a positive note in the representation on and off screen in the Malayalam cinema industry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if uh, there be some questions uh, for the paper that has been just presented. Um, and uh, you know, cinema is very interesting space to engage with uh, for all uh, research scholars and, uh, of mass communication. And I, I, I would like I have one question, Gayatri. Uh, in the meantime, as we go ahead, uh, but I think before that, Tamasa has, has a question. So I'll first question, which is: Do you think women characters are mostly written one-dimensional in regional cinema? in comparison to their male counterparts. So this is uh, the general question about the unequal treatment of the uh, characters. Ma'am, it is obvious that Indian, in Indian movies are portraying women uh, in a very less important manner than men. And especially when it comes to the case of tribal women, this doubles. Like Even tri tribals don't have their own representation in Malayalam cinema. And, uh, even if represented, they are the, the, their male counterparts will be represented. So uh, coming to tribal women, right now, Malayalam cinema industry is in a phase where there are revolutionary changes. Like one tribal director came, and a tribal lady director came, and that is like and many actor, act, actors, uh, lady actors are coming. And so scripting, and um, e even in the case of uh, Malayalam novel industry, there a lot of uh, uh, themes are coming based on tribal women and their uh, the atrocities they face and the, the achievements they make in life. The, the more of a positive note. Many many of the novels are coming and a lot of newspaper cuttings. So real life inspired characters will be coming ahead. I, I, I'm positively hoping for it. All right. I think uh, because we have uh, we have already overshot our time, so we will uh, end this uh, presentation here and Thank we'll you. move on to the next presentation, uh, next the last presentation, last presentation for the yes. session. This is uh, the Hungarian government's anti-gender policy and Hungarian tween audiences identity production through Disney Princess from UK Anna uh, Subori. She would be uh, she will be presenting the paper. So Anna. All yours. Hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So, do you see my presentation? Yes. No. No screen is not visible. Hold on. Yes. Yes. Oh. Okay. So. Okay. So you see my screen, right? Yes. yes, yes. Okay. Um, so, um, hi everyone. So, I'm going to. My name is Anna Zuburi, and today I'm going to talk about the Hungarian government's anti-gender policy and Hungarian tweens, tween audiences' identity production to Disney princesses. 
Um, as a first thing, I would like to uh, express my solidarity with the members of the University of Theatre of Fimart in Budapest. The university's autonomy is in danger, so that's why. So after the introduction, I'm going to provide you with short background information, talk about my research philosophy and methodology, and then about Hungarian twins and Disney princesses, and there will be a conclusion. So when we talk about uh, princess animation, they are claimed to be the most popular and influential Disney films when it comes to younger girls. So the question arises, why Disney princesses? And although there are lots of discussion about the princess mania, we still don't understand the phenomenon. We know that the brand was created in 2000 in order to sell Disney princess characters as products by the unification under the umbrella of the nostalgic, romantic and idealistic images of a princess. And since then, it became, massive, became a massive phenomenon, an international commodity, and a result a source of debates and critics in, in academia and criticism and admiration among audiences. And um, there are tons of tons of tons of sexual analysis about Disney princesses, and they mainly mainly focus on their body representation or on gender. And there are claims that they represent gender in a stereotypical way, and it has a negative effect on younger self-image. And there are uh, labels as princess syndrome and princess problem. And Disney's claim to have an immense power over childhood culture and to be the conveyor of femininity or more broadly gender. So based on these sexual analysis, the, the princess phenomenon seen and its perception are understood to be homogeneous. Um, twins, uh, that is an in between age, age group, between childhood and adolescence, sorry, between age 7 and 14, and they consume media in the highest ratio among children and they form a lucrative market, but they are also at the crucial stage of life and establishing one's identity become a central issue. So they rely more than, more than adolescents heavily on others to tell them how to understand the world and how to place themselves in it. And they often look for a role model and they often find these in media. And why, so this is why I focus on twins and why Hungarian twins, basically because there is hardly any audience research on this age group. As Katalin Luschuk highlighted, Eastern European children's mediated culture, if mentioned at all, constitute a little more than anecdotal evidence and was discussed in publication footnotes. So when it comes to the, co the, uh, the connection between Disney and twins, there are three uh, periods that I would like to highlight. The, the first is the Disney Renaissance between 1989 and 1999. And as I mentioned, there was a princess brand created in 2000. And there was a tween moment in 2001 and 2000, uh, between 2001 and 2011, when basically in American public culture, child audiences was redefined and tweens became the target audience. And basically, Disney can be seen to dominate the construction of tweenhood economically, industrially, not others. So with regards to my research philosophy and methodology, I use interpretivism, hermeneutics, and inductive approach, and as a method, uh, methodology, interpretive, qualitative, and focused micro, short-term ethnographic approach, I took conversational interviews and used methods of thematic and semiotic analysis. But when we do research with children, obviously there are ethical issues, so they are vulnerable, or some studies uh, consider them as incompetent. I approach them as strong, capable, and knowledgeable expert of their own lives and own lives and competent social actors. But when there is a research, obviously the researcher's person also needs to be considered. So as a person and as a researcher. Me as a person, I am a dual Hungarian British citizen, so I am an insider outsider. But as a researcher, there are claims that um, a researcher can only exist in the space between in this dual position of insider outsider. So that means I was in this double duality uh, position, double dual position. I took 19 paired conversation with 38 children, aged 7 to 10, 22 females, 16 males, 15 hours data in total. The sessions were in Hungarian, transcribed and translated to English. The pilot study was in January 2018, the field work April, May 2018, mainly at schools of different sizes, so 150, 475 and 950 pupils, both urban and rural parts of the country. I highlighted April because there was a gen um, the general election in, in that point and it had an effect on the data collection and um, the sessions with the children. So I recruited the, the, the children through gatekeepers. They were friends of mine, but that wasn't without any backlash. Basically that being an insider, having primary access to the film field doesn't guarantee, do not guarantee the secondary one. So the parents had to sign the consent form, obviously, so that meant less participants and the word gender because of the previously outlined reasons was a sensitive topic. Uh, according to the school principal in village too, so she decided that I cannot do the research in her school. And when doing research with three children, there is an asymmetrical relationship. Um, um, 
between adult and child in addition to those between researcher participants. So I approach the children as their friend. I offer them choices as they can, they could pick pseudonyms, pseudonyms for themselves, which video clips they want to watch and with the drawing and building. And um, so the sessions look like first there were ice breaking question and then we watch certain videos. And then uh, I asked the children to describe the ideal, the generic, and the Disney princesses. And the reason why I asked the children, because I wanted to know whether all those textual analysis are right with regards to whether the princess phenomenon is indeed a homogeneous uh, phenomenon. And basically, according to the children, there were four main definers of a princess, the dress, friendship, wealth, and gender characteristics. And the common feature of the Disney princess is that they are brave, beautiful, and the most popular were Pocahontas, Nula, Rapunzel, and Merida. The ideal princess, according to the children, brave, curious, hardworking, talented, a bit tomboyish, able to, pr to protect herself and has many friends, so she's a positive figure. The generic, uh, although generally speaking, uh, she is beautiful and smart, but also whiny, lazy. One bossy. minute left. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, lazy, bossy, too girly, needs protection, and lonely, so she's the negative. Uh, the Disney princesses were uh, overwhelmingly positive, especially considering Pocahontas, Mula, Rapunzel, and Merida. And as a result, the, Disney, the princess phenomenon is extremely complex and it's personally, profoundly culture and society dependent, so it's not homogeneous. It's so I need to finish my thesis. Um, that feels really powerful. I hope I can do it. <laughs> so please don't be afraid to ask. And that, okay. As well, it's like, uh, you know, um, it's a kind of an information um, that I'm prepared for in the sense that um, gender studies may not be allowed in Hungary, but uh, yeah. So if there be any questions, uh, it will be, uh, can I just, are there any questions in the chat box? Uh, yes. Um, no, I think there are comments. Yes. And uh, they're appreciating. So uh, is if the, there be anything else to be added, uh, then it's fine. Otherwise, we'll wind up the session because we have already exceeded a lot, uh, the time limit. Time, yes. Yes. So uh, I think I um, we've had some uh, interest. Yes. Yes, please, Surita. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Just one question to Anna. Yep. Uh, Anna, you, yep. uh, there was one uh, finding you mentioned that uh, they find tomboyish the characters, right? Uh, yes. How how do they perceive that? Uh, like they like it definitely, but uh, and also they uh, too girlish. Some of them has stayed. So how yep. do they perceive those concepts? So basically, in Hungarian, we don't have the word tomboy. Uh, so they described uh, the idea of princess as boyish. So when I asked, asked that, basically it was like, I asked the children, so if it was up to you, how would you describe an idea of princess? And then later on the generic one. So how, what the generic princess is like? So when it was the ideal, uh, I remember specifically one girl, but it was like, according to uh, more of them. So one girl, and I also, I, I, I spoke to boys as well, uh, as I mentioned. So one girl said, I want her to be like boys. I don't want her to be a boy, but I want her to be like boys, strong and brave. So that's what she said. And um, it also that, that tomboyish, uh, feature of uh, the ideal princess was also with regards to her clothing and also with regards to her physical freedom. So, for example, they wanted, the children wanted the ideal princess to wear trousers, comfortable shoes, um, and they also wanted her to run around uh, in the garden and be a snowman. And as opposed to the ideal, the generic princess was wearing uncomfortable dresses, tight dresses, high heels, corset, and she was not allowed to go outside. She had to stay in the castle and just do whatever she has to do. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. And uh, I think uh, there was one question by Baishaki for Gayatri, I guess, uh, which is what was the reason of changing the tribal women's role in different shades? So um, in the Malayalam cinema presentation, if you could quickly take that up. Uh, 
Do we yes, have a uh, Gayatri with us? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Gayatri is around. So, would you like to take this question? Uh, okay, last uh, question from Baishakhi. Right. What was the reason the, of changing the tribal women's role in different shades? Over a period of time. Ma'am, the basic change is, is that the, the way in which the audience, like the people in Kerala are conceiving or are, are, are viewing tribals has changed. And that obviously reflected in the literature and in, in film also. And, uh, and um, using tribes for mere com com as mere comical objects was being uh, rejected by many many of the uh, audience clusters and, and, and a lot of mass movements were uh, came into force in, in social media regarding such type of portrayals. So uh, obviously that might be the reason for the change in the last 10 years where Facebook was uh, very, very well circulated among the students. So I think um, youth is rejecting the way in which tribals are portrayed. Obviously, that reflected in films. All right. So on that note, we bring this session to a close. So I thank each one of you for uh, being here and uh, presenting your papers, as well as those who participated in the session. Um, thank you. Thanks a lot. And um, I uh, leave the floor to you. Um, so please. please thank you, Shita, ma'am. Uh, uh, thank you, Shweta, ma'am. Uh, it was you know, too time consuming for you to be here for all this time. And we, we are, we, it was your gracious presence that made it even better. So we uh, wish to have another interesting session with you tomorrow. And sure. for the participants here, uh, a small mention, the feedback link will be shared at the end of tomorrow's session, most likely the te technical session. And now uh, th and th I thank all the audience for their participation and their presence. And before calling it a day for today, I would invite uh, Professor Shushmita Mitro, uh, Associate Professor, Department of History, Women's College, Kolkata, and an IQAC member uh, to deliver the vote of thanks. Uh, so Shushmita, ma'am, over to you now. Thank you, Ushashi. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. yes, Shushmita, yes. Ma Thank you. Uh, so the first day of the two-day international webinar on women and media, the changing narratives and identities organized by the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication, Women's College Calcutta, in collaboration with IQAC, Women's College Calcutta, comes to a close. It is now my very pleasant duty to offer the vote of thanks our heartfelt thanks to Professor Pijush Kanti Panigrahi, Dean, Faculty Council for Postgraduate Studies in Education, Journalism, and Library Sciences, University of Calcutta. Thank you, sir, for taking time out from your extremely busy schedule to grace this occasion as the chief patron of our webinar. Your presence has been a source of inspiration to us. We thank Dr. Mo principal, Women's College Calcutta, and chairperson of the webinar for her support and encouragement. Thanks to Department of Journalism and Mass Communication, Women's College Calcutta, and IQAC, Women's College Calcutta, for jointly organizing this webinar. We thank Dr. Shurita Basu, convener of the webinar, and the members of our seminar committee. Thanks to Srimuthi Rilina Kanjilal, for her opening remarks. We extend our warmest thanks to the distinguished participants of day one. Thanks to Dr. Jilly Boyce K, lecturer, Media and Communication, University of Leicester, UK, for delivering the keynote address, which was extremely informative and thought provoking. Thanks to Dr. Fatima M, Assistant Professor, AJK Mass Communication Research Center, Jamia Millia Islamia University for chairing Plenary One. I thank the speakers of this session for sharing their uh, fascinating views and experiences. Ms. Ruchika Negi, Ms. Neha Chopra, and Ms. Aisha Paul. Thank you. We extend our warmest thanks 
to Dr. Sweta Singh, Assistant Professor, University School of Mass Communication, Guru Govind Singh, Indraprastha University, New Delhi, for chairing Technical Session 1. Thank you, ma'am, for giving us so much time. Uh, thanks to the presenters of uh, the six very interesting papers. But before that, I also have to thank our very own Srimuthi Roshmi Roy Mukherjee of the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication for co-chairing the session. Uh, thanks to the presenters of the papers, uh, Srimati L. Ramalakshmi and Dr. Arul Selvan S., Srimati Amrita Balakrishnan and Dr. Francis P. Bartley, Srimati Christy Sebastian and Dr. Vashupradha Sri Krishna, Srimati Amla Tichako, Sri R. Shivinandan and Dr. Shurita Basu, Srimati Gayatri Baiju and uh, Srimati Anna Zubori. We thank all our guests, the staff, teachers and students of Women's College, Calcutta for being a part of our webinar. And finally, thanks to Sri Media Works for their excellent technical support. Thank you all and hope to welcome you back to the second day of our webinar tomorrow, 29th September 2020 at 5 p.m. sharp. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you, Shushmita. Thank you, Shushmita. Thanks, Shweta. Nice to meet you tomorrow then. See you. Yeah, see you tomorrow. Bye. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Shweta, ma'am.